Perfect. We are live now. Hello, everyone. We are about to start. We invite you to come for your favorite coffee or drink and join us to enjoy the agenda we have prepared for today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cuneco. We will start in just a moment. So please, as Felipe said, go have a cup of, uh, cup of tea or coffee, and we will start in just a second. Thank you so much for being here. Great, we are both 160 attendees and rising. Great to see you all, guys. Today we have a really nice agenda, and of course, we want to uh, present ourselves in just a moment while people start to getting connected. So, welcome from the people in from the different countries that are here. Hello, Dimitri, turning from Lisbon. How are you? From London, uh, Blake, and we are in Colombia. Some other people from Colombia. How are you guys? Great. So we are about to get 200 in this. Uh... Okay, David. So I think I can get started now. So the agenda is busy. Let's so go. I think we should start. Uh, okay, as I say, hello everyone. Uh, okay, David, it's a pleasure to greet you and share with you as a co-host in this event, Cuneco Colombia. Uh, it's a pleasure to all the audience that connects from Colombia, Latin America, and the whole world. My name is Felipe Cano. I've been an entrepreneur and enthusiast in blockchain technology for about five years. And today I'm very excited to share and learn from the industry leaders and experts. How are you, David? How do you feel about Cuneco today? I'm really, really, really happy today, Felipe. And I'm very excited to be part of this event too. Uh, as Felipe said, my name is David Riascos. I'm a Colombian ecosystem lead at c -Labs. I'm a psychologist, a blockchain enthusiast, and I consider myself an altruist. Uh, Felipe and I uh, are going to be the host of this special event called Cuneco. And I would, uh, and it would be awesome to see from uh, which part of the world you are attending this event. Uh, please mention your country in the little bullet right to your screen, and that way we can all have the sense of what countries are with us. Uh, Perfect. Uh, I'm wondering, maybe people are thinking, what is the meaning of Cuneco? I want to let them know that Cuneco means togetherness, togetherness in Esperanto language and it's precisely what we want to achieve with cello blockchain technology by connecting people around the world with a common purpose that that is a really nice uh, a really nice thing to say felipe and we are going to start so uh as we said uh, today this event will be hosting virtually from colombia that's why we are going to provide some colombian flavor and this is a difficult task since colombia is so diverse because we would, um, because I will define Colombia as a group of 32 stories writing in magical realism. And for those unfamiliar with the term, magical realism is a type of writing that aims to describe the real world as having an undercurrent ma of magic and fantasy. Because we have 32 departments and everyone has different cultures and everyone is so much different from each other. Uh, so we want to try to provide a full sensation about Colombia's nature in just one video. Welcome to Cuneco All Hands, hosted virtually uh, from Colombia, and hit the music, please. Great, so this is Colombian flavor. Uh, we hope you will have the feeling of the digital tour guide from Colombia. As we said before, uh, Colombia is so diverse that you could eat one different fruit per day for 365 days until you still won't be able to taste it all. We have more than 43 types of native fruits. Colombia is the home of the most nature, um, the most nature diverse country per feet square, and the home of the greatest diversity of flowers, more than 1,500 types of flowers. And also, Colombia is the second place with the most national holidays. In total, we have 18. 12 are Catholic and six are civic holidays. Of the first place is India with 21. Perfect. So, uh, so with more than 800. Uh, thousand species of beer. Colombia is the home of the most diversity of bears in the world and also home of the 10% of the entire planet's wildlife. 
as a diverse world, we need leaders with the desire to connect the dots and to create inclusion for people. And today, our speaker will provide their vision of a world with design for all. With this little virtual tool, we start our event. Welcome, all of you guys. Okay, so we want to start with our mission, and Celo's mission is to build a financial system that creates the condition uh, for prosperity for everyone. Cuneco is a place for, uh, to, hold, to foster Celo's togetherness, focus on share news and announcements from the Celo ecosystem with the community. And in the spirit of leading with inclusion, the theme of today's gathering is designing for all. This is a tenet from Celo's community. We believe that to to create a truly inclusive financial system, we must begin by serving uh, those who need it the most. Perfect, so let's move to the agenda, please. Okay, this is the agenda we have prepared for you today. So we are going to address very interesting topics. So we are going to talk about designing for all, mobile first DeFi on Celo, future of payments on Celo, and more exciting things. So back to you, David. Thanks, Felipe. And um, I, I want to start saying that a community is a group of people gathered, sharing the same, the same values and beliefs. And our first speaker not only achieved to bring this feeling to digital life, but also to the Web3 wonderfully. So I'm happy to invite uh, to the stage to Kevin Owaki, founder at Gitcoin, to the stage, who will be walking us through Gitcoin vision and why he is excited about Seller. Please, please stay in community uh, for a special announcement uh, at the end of this talk. Welcome, Kevin, to this uh, to this stage. Hi, David. Hi, Felipe. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome, no. Kevin. Welcome. <laughs> it's so great to be here, and thank you for the magnificent introduction. I'm really excited to go to Colombia when DevCon rolls around, and I'm really excited for Gitcoin's partnership with with Celo. Um, so basically, the tenant, the community tenant today is designing for all. And um, I'm just super passionate about how we're building a new open source financial system that hopefully works for little people and not just for bankers on Wall Street. And I think that we just really, uh, one of the reasons I got into this space is to respect the deep diversity and plurality of the world's culture and, and talent that uh, I think I, I think isn't fully expressed in the system that we inherited from the boomers. So um, basically, let's see, uh, I'm on my screen, I've got me me up, but I'm gonna try to put up the, the slides that we've got here. Hopefully that shows up now. Um, one of the things that we're working on at Gitcoin is, is quadratic funding which is this, this concept by Vitalik Buterin and Zoe Hitzig and Glenn Weil. It's, it's basically an economic system where you raise a matching amount and that matching amount is distributed to a community that is doing valuable work in public goods uh, in your community. And you distribute the matching amount according to a crowdfunding campaign that runs in parallel to that matching amount. And on Gitcoin, we're doing about $500,000 per quarter in matching to crowdfunding contributions on our project called Gitcoin Grants, which is basically just a crowdfunding campaign. And I've, I've built this little handy quadratic funding calculator to show you all the power of quadratic funding. So we do $500,000 in matching. And if two grants both raise $10 in funding, but one has a broader base of support then the matching funds will go mostly to the project that has the, mo the broad base of support. And so, you know, when we think about designing for all, when we think about building up a financial system that's organic and supports people from the bottoms up, I'm just really excited to be able to express the preferences of the Celo community, of local communities, in a way that supports the organic preferences of, of everyday people. And to me, this is an example of designing for all. To zoom out a little bit, I, I believe that what we're doing in the blockchain space is we're creating the internet of value. The internet of information changed our world because now anyone could send information across a computer network without an intermediary. And it changed everything in society that relied on information, technology, entertainment, media, politics. Now everyday people were on the same sort of distribution network as the New York Times. 
And now with the internet of value, what we're doing is we're building a computer network that can send value across the internet. And so the, alleg the parallel is that we could possibly reinvent the financial system. Anything that relies on the, the transfer of financial value in, in today's society could be changed by the blockchain based internet. And so there's this whole design space in which we're creating an open source financial system and we've got programmable money. And so what will you build with, with programmable money is the big question. And yeah, we can go on to the next slide. I saw us uh, maybe sneak a peek at it right there. So that's my challenge to you. What will you build in, in this paradigm of designing for all? And Gitcoin has partnered with, with Celo to build a, to, to build build this world. The Cello Make It Mobile Hackathon is going to be starting next week, and we're going to have thousands of dollars in prizes available for builders who are building in the Cello ecosystem, who are designing for all. And I'm just really excited to explore this design space with you on Gitcoin during our hackathon and also in Gitcoin grants in, in 2021. And I'm also just really excited to come to Columbia and to hang out with you all and just bask in the rich plurality of this community that all wants to build a better world with you together. So thank you so much for to, to Cello uh, and, and QNECO for having me as the opening keynote. And I'm really excited to see what the rest of the presenters and the community have to say. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kevin, for sharing with us the, these insights about blockchain, programmable money, and the crowdfunding uh, tool you present today. So let's move to Jarrell. Thank you, Kevin. Hey, hey, everybody. Can you hear me all right? I think that you can. Um, yes. If we could go. Hi, I'm Jarrell. I work at C Labs, and I do everything from hackathons to fostering developer relations with awesome builders and like designers and doers. And I'm really excited to kind of take what Kevin has has put out there and, and give a little bit more context to it from the from the cello side of things for our hackathon. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So, really, our question is like, Web three can dominate the mobile app industry. Why not? You know. Why can't we? So uh, let's try and make it mobile. And like this, this statement being that uh, there's a lot of dApps or a lot of apps out there on on cell phones. Most of them are around productivity, gaming, uh, connection, communication, social media. Um, but there's a, there's not really any of like the really innovative stuff coming out of the Web three world. And like that's what we are we're here to do. There's not a good reason why Web three, once it's created mobile for the mobile platform, like through Cello, can't run the the mobile app department as well and uh, we've already seen what kind of amazing change can come from us in the uh web-based world so let's take that innovation and that magic and put it into the mobile community um could you make, go to the next slide so yeah we're partnering with gitcoin to make this a reality as kevin was saying and gitcoin has done a ton of social impact uh social impact work and They've also just created this incredible catalyzing resource for the Web3 community, for Web2 people to start easily getting involved in what we're building here, and for designers and, and just people of all talent backgrounds to really get in and see what they can add. So um, could you go to the next slide? So just to reiterate, like let's look at the actual market that's out there. There's 6 billion mobile phone users globally. There's expected to be about 600 to 700 million more in just sub-Saharan Africa. So extrapolate that to the rest of the world. We're looking at quite a few hundred million more people coming into the mobile phone world, which is to say that these are the most disenfranchised and the uh, most uh, secluded from the you know developed world that's out there. And the, the, all they have is mobile phones. So this is uh, an opportunity for us to take a market that's waiting for Web3 and, and, and bring it to them in a medium that they can actually interact with it. Um, could you go to the next slide? So yeah, we are really excited to invite you and your friends, anyone in your network to take everything you've learned from Web3, everything you've learned from Web2 and, and kind of catalyze you around this idea of designing for all. And when we say that, like the core tenant of Cello being designed for all, we, we are embodying that by creating 
reusable resources on a medium that actually goes for everyone and actually can be accessed by everyone. So I really encourage you to scan this and join the uh, hackathon and it's going from February 25th to uh, April 7th. There will be $60,000 worth of prizes um, and there will be there'll be bonus awards, partners, there'll be all sorts of features and events. And uh, we encourage you to go check out our landing page, go check out our Gitcoin tribe and our Gitcoin hackathon tribe, our page and uh, get involved in, in whatever way you can. Thank you, Jarrell, for being with us and sharing your insights about Web3. And we invite all the community to join the movement, to join the hackathon. Thank you very much, David. Let's move on the agenda. What's next? Yes. So, hey, please just scan this uh, QR code and uh, be part of it. So nothing in the next um, section, nothing says, um, nothing says designed for all that putting trust in those people, ideas, or companies aiming to change the world. The next speaker knows about this. And Rene Rainsberg, who is painting the vision at C-Labs as a CEO, is going to introduce him. Welcome to Connect, Rene. We are excited to have you here. Thanks, guys. I'm really thrilled to be here. And I'm even more thrilled to announce uh, Olaf Karsunbi as our next uh, keynote speaker. Um, Olaf really needs no introduction. You know, As the founder of uh, Polychain Capital, he's been behind many of the most successful um, projects and protocols in the crypto space and you know i don't think seller would be where we are today without um him and and his help um you know from being one of the first backers and trusted advisors back in 2017 when we first started working on the ideas leading to seller with american sap to uh today where you know um he and his firm you know are very active community members from running a, a validator group uh, on the seller network and um and of course uh in many other ways but um one that i think is um is critical uh to to the community is, is really helping uh fund the the next generation of, of projects that are building on the seller protocol and um you know doing that through this polychain seller ecosystem fund um, which has already funded um, several companies, many of them here today at Coneco. Um, so without further ado, Olaf, thanks for being here today and uh, looking forward uh, to, your, to your talk. Hey, Renee, thanks so much for having me. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, as Renee said, I've known Renee and Merrick for many years now and have been involved in um, the creation of Cello back when this was very much just an architectural sort of prototype. Uh, thinking about phone number based identities and uh, mobile payments um, way before the word DeFi even existed. Um, so there's a few things that I found really interesting about Celo then and I think continue to be um, what makes Celo such an interesting platform for mobile crypto use, particularly uh, financial instruments based on the DeFi sort of landscape. Um, so first, just th from a thematic target, um, people want to use mobile apps around the world. It's only in crypto that we are used to using big clunky desktop software tools, as well as Chrome extensions that are sort of third party software tools just to interact with specific applications. Um, if we want to touch non-crypto users and actually bring new people into this, we need to have a mobile first uh, experience. Um, the second thing is that there's a very tight relationship between efficiency at the infrastructure and protocol layer and the actual resulting end user experience. Um, for example, one of the hard things about using Ethereum financial instruments today is simply how expensive they are. Um, and that has to do with a lot of the infrastructural layer. Um, if we could improve the infrastructural layer, we can actually lead to a better user experience, lead to cheaper transactions, cheaper smart contract interactions, and actually unlock um, a lot of use cases, especially for people um, who maybe don't have a you know ten or a hundred thousand dollar investment portfolio, um, which is sort of the only type of user today um, that can really benefit from from DeFi and Ethereum. Um, and so through the sort of um, more efficient consensus and more scalable system that Celo has, that even though it's sort of um, narrowly an infrastructure improvement um, and breakthrough, it really leads to a better user experience um, by, by virtue of having faster blocks, um, faster confirmations, cheaper fees. 
Um, the other very interesting thing is the phone number uh, kind of identity system. Um, most users, especially these non-crypto users that are mobile first, um, that want to interact with DeFi, um, they really don't want to deal with private key management. And I think I speak for everyone when I say nobody really actually wants to deal with private key management. It's just the best um, thing we have today. Um, so by using kind of a phone number as an identity style system to interact with DeFi instruments, um, I do think that could be a massive user experience unlock um, and bring in sort of 10 or 100 times more users than are willing to download third party software and do their own uh, uh, private key management. Um, so this sort of phone number identity system, I do think is another critical component of building better mobile first DeFi UX um, in addition to this better infrastructure through proof of stake and the other great uh, efficiency improvements Solo has. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that we are funding entrepreneurs uh, building in this area. Um, at Polychain, we talk a lot about more usable DeFi um, and better design patterns for DeFi, how we can actually productize a lot of the sort of what you call, might call radical experiments happening at the fringes of the DeFi ecosystem and actually bring those to market in a more accessible, um, um, sort of concrete productized manner. A lot of this means building um, mobile first or at least uh, mobile accessible. Um, and so as Renee mentioned, um, we've already started investing in businesses building into, into the solo ecosystem. And we have an entire ecosystem fund um, dedicated specifically to investing in businesses that are building on top of Celo. So if you are an entrepreneur and you are building um, mobile DeFi on Celo or really anything else on Celo, uh, we're definitely interested in talking. Um, we really are excited to bring DeFi to the masses. I think that right now we need this sort of user experience unlock um, to port these experiences to mobile and actually bring these financial tools to the people that need them most. Um, and I'm very excited about the prospect for Cello um, to be the platform that enables that. So thanks so much for having me, Renee. Thank you, Renee, for sharing your vision and extend your support from Poliche Funds. And Olaf, thank you for sharing your vision about a mobile ecosystem on DeFi and we agree with you on improve the infrastructure to, to make it more accessible, cheaper and inclusive and promote and promote more use cases. So thank you very much for being with us and see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Here I go. Thank you, Olaf, uh, for being here also. And we are going to, uh, our next section is called Community Spotlight. Right? So in our next speaker initiative mission is to provide us access to credit of, for any credit worthy borrower and access to yield uh, for any liquidity provider. Mula is an open source protocol for decentralized money markets on Celo blockchain governed by MOO tokens holders. Also, Mula enables liquidity providers to earn compound interest on their Celo dollars or David, you muted. David. You are silent, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so I was saying that um, our next uh, speaker initiative mission is to provide access to credit for any credit worthy borrower and has access to yield for any liquidity provider. Mula is an open source protocol for decentralized money uh, markets on Celos blockchain governed by MOO tokens holders. Also, Mula enables liquidity providers to earn compound interest on their Celo dollars or Celo. Patrick Bayron, Mula's founders, thanks uh, for being here with us. And this stage is yours. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much, David, for the introduction. Um, if I could get the next slide, please. Excellent. So uh, as he mentioned, uh, you know, the problems that we're solving at a, mic at a macro level are that one in three adults does not have access to a savings account or a line of credit. And uh, at a micro level, uh, CUSD holders up until this time were not able to earn compound interest on their money. Uh, also, another problem uh, on chain is that traders are not able to take on chain leverage long or short positions in the price of Celo. 
Uh, next slide, please. And so, you know, we are designing this for everybody. And uh, our goal is to democratize access to yield. The way that I think about uh, achieving that is uh, one, by leveraging the low cost transaction fees. Uh, as Olaf mentioned just previously, uh, the on, on other platforms such as Ethereum, access to yield is very expensive and it can be prohibitively expensive for small dollar holders and folks that don't own a whole lot of money. Uh, also, it can be prohibitively expensive for people who do not have an ability to uh, hold their money for long periods of time. Uh, so a couple of the problems that we're solving are uh, around low transaction fees, no time restrictions on deposits, how long you have to keep a deposit. Uh, and also because of the low transaction fees, you can deposit funds for a short period of time, earn whatever compound interest you can, and then withdraw and spend the money when you need access to the money. Uh, another interesting feature is this idea of redirecting interest earned. Uh, and this uh, improves the, this really increases the design landscape of what's possible. So doing things like redirecting your interest earned to a charity, uh, redirecting your interest earned to a family member, to a business that you want to support. Really the, the options are, are very much endless in this capacity. Uh, we're also democratizing access to credit, and this is something that we'll be rolling out more better user experiences around, uh, but through a, a system of credit delegation. This is the idea that if I deposit money into a Moolah market and I do not want to borrow against my collateral, I can give my borrowing capacity to another user. So I could delegate it to a local business. I could delegate it to a startup that I want to back. I could delegate it to another delegator who is able to deploy that capital into their, uh, into their local community. And today I'm thrilled to announce the public beta release of uh, Moolah Market. And so I'm gonna run through and show you a demo of what's possible. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And everything that you're seeing is taking place on my phone right here. Uh, and this is live on the Cello mainnet. So the first thing that I'm going to do is that I come to app.moolah.market and I'm going to connect my Valora wallet. So I tap connect Valora. That's going to open up the Valora wallet app on my phone. And I'm going to go ahead and allow the connection. Uh, if you've used Ethereum and MetaMask, this is a very similar structure in that the Valora wallet holds my keys and will be signing transactions. And now you can see that it's pulling in my wallet information. Uh, I can see my balance as well as, uh, as well as my wallet address. So the first thing I want to do is I want to start earning compound interest on my cello dollars. So I'm going to initiate a deposit of CUSD. In this case, I'm going to deposit 110 CUSD and it's gonna open up the Valora app on my phone. I'm gonna go ahead and sign that, allow it. It wants me to input my PIN code to confirm that this is my intention. And when this transaction is confirmed, we're gonna be able to see on the blockchain uh, the debit transaction from my wallet and the credit of the MCUSD tokens. So first thing I wanna point out is that that happened in real time. Uh, that took about five seconds. And uh, you could see that the, the blockchain explorer hasn't even had time to, uh, to to pull the transaction data yet. Um, so I'll go ahead and refresh this. Uh, okay, it looks like that's gonna take just a second to pull in to explore the blockchain explorer. So I'm going to come back to the home. And now you can see that uh, I have deposited 110 CUSD into the Moolah markets. Uh, let's say that I am bearish on the price of Cello and I wanna take a short position in the price of Cello. I'm gonna tap on the menu and now I'm gonna borrow against my CUSD collateral. So I'm gonna borrow about seven, uh, almost eight Cello. I'm gonna sign the transaction again using my Valora wallet. And when this transaction, uh, when this transaction confirms, so let's see, make sure I've got, there we go. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and try and view this transaction. Uh, looks like it's also still uh, pending in the Explorer. Uh, but uh, now I've just borrowed Cello against my CUSD debt. So if I wanna take a short position, I come into Valora and I would sell the 7.8 Cello that I just borrowed. And when this transaction is confirmed, I will now be in a short position. If the CUSD price of Cello drops, then my trade will be in the money. Uh, and but you know, we're watching all of these amazing demos. We all know that the price of Cello is gonna go up over time because this community is amazing. So instead, I'm gonna go ahead and repay my Cello debt. 
and then I'm going to get into a leverage long position. So the first thing that I'm going to do is uh, repay the debt that position that I just took out. And then I'm going to deposit Cello into uh, the Moolah market. So I will deposit approximately 12 Cello. And then I'm going to borrow CUSD against, oops, let's try that one more time. Let's go ahead and deposit Cello. And as soon as this transaction is deposited, uh, I am then going to borrow CUSD against my, oh, let's try it one more time. Like I said, it's, a, it's an open beta. Sometimes live demos don't go as smoothly as they do in practice. Fingers crossed here, folks. There we go. Okay, it went through that time. Uh, so now I have just deposited Cello, and now I'm going to borrow CUSD against my uh, Cello collateral. So in this case, I'm, I'm borrowing about 72 uh, CUSD. And as soon as this transaction is confirmed, I can then sell these Cello dollars for Cello using the Valora app. And uh, it will uh, put me into a leverage long position. So in this case, I'm going to buy Cello. We'll switch to CUSD, review the transaction. And now I am in a leverage long position. Uh, so, like I said, everything that you just viewed is taking place live on Cello Mainnet. Um, if you are an algorithmic trader, you can also access these markets using our CLI commands. Uh, we have APIs published so that other wallets can integrate directly into the Moolah markets. And uh, you can reach me on Discord in the Cello chat. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Patrick, thank you very much for being with us and for the demonstration and taking us into the experience of Mula. Definitely, you are doing a great job working on democratizing access to yield and credit, and we, we wish you all the best, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. David, okay. back to you. Thank you, Patrick, also for that uh, amazing demo. Um, our ne next guest in the community spotlight section is Ian Macalinao, founder at Ubiswap. And Ubiswap is a protocol for decentralized exchange and automated liquidity provision on Celo. Welcome to the stage, Ian. Please tell us more about Ubiswap. Thanks, David. Um, hey, guys. I'm Ian, the founder of Ubiswap. So Ubiswap is a fork of Uniswap built on Celo. And first, I, I want to explain why I'm working on this. Uh, next slide, please. So DeFi investing on Cell today is pretty limited uh, and for several reasons. One is there's low on-chain Cello and CSD liquidity. So a lot of people within the Cello community would love to invest more in Cello, but we can't really use Cello to buy more Cello without moving the market significantly. And this is because the on-chain exchange is meant for issuing seniorage, so liquid liquidity is intentionally limited. As a result, people move Cello dollars off of Cello in order to buy more Cello. But the whole point of using a blockchain is not have to rely on centralized uh, services in the first place. Another thing is that there's not that many investment opportunities on Cello. So lending platforms like Moolah are going to lock tons of capital for Cello holders. There's over $180 million of circulating Cello that can and will be borrowed against. But there isn't really a place for the borrowed money to go. There's currently only one asset to invest in on Cello that's easy to find. There might be other assets out there, but um, they're hard to find. And also, uh, new assets can't get liquidity. If you're building a new DeFi project with a token, you don't have anywhere for people to invest. There's nowhere for people to stake tokens to yield farm. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where Ubiswap comes in. Ubiswap is a decentralized exchange and automated market maker for seller assets. So there's two parts to this statement. First of all, it's a decentralized exchange, meaning anyone can list or trade any asset. And it's also an automated market maker, meaning it provides liquidity to seller without people having to actively manage their positions on seller. Uh, next slide, please. So our mission is to increase Celo adoption by providing the liquidity foundation for DeFi on Celo. So imagine a world where people can grow up learning about a crypto financial system before ever touching a bank. And we have the power to create this world for countries that are currently unbanked. In order to do so, though, we need to have a robust ecosystem of financial products. And these financial products will en enable millions of people to borrow, lend, invest, et cetera, all from their phone, without ever having to deal with banks. Because financial services companies are really expensive to operate and create in new markets. Uh, but with crypto, developers just write code. So you can just launch things a lot faster. And the core building block for cell DeFi ecosystem would 
could be, or Ubiswap is one of the core building blocks of the Celo DeFi ecosystem. With uh, Moolah, Ubiswap, and Compound, Celo is ready for any and all DeFi activity. So next slide, please. So Ubiswap is a mobile-first DeFi exchange. So what does mobile-first mean to us? It doesn't mean we're mobile only. It just means that we're building an exchange for the masses. Most money in the financial markets comes from institutions and larger players who are on their, or a lot of them are at computers looking at charts. And we're gonna support them really well. But Robinhood made stock trading viral because it's so easy to download and use on the go. And it's easy for anyone to just start being part of the financial world. It's also based on Uniswap, so it can integrate with any smart contract that's based on Uniswap. So you can expect a lot of core DeFi projects to be ported to sell it really soon. And it's also a lot faster and cheaper than Ethereum. So transactions on uh, Ubiswap take under 15 seconds, but the fees are also less than a tenth of a cent. On uh, Ethereum, it's very easy for a swap to take over three minutes and be $100. So this is very big for the DeFi community. Next slide, please. So yield farming is extremely important in making a blockchain big. And it's because it, uh, capital acts like a fluid. It flows to wherever it's able to be used best. DeFi continues to have high yields and thus conti continues to attract more capital. So if you look at this chart here, um, on June 16, that's when the first yield farming token was launched, COP, which is for uh, compound finance. And before COP, there were about a billion dollars blocked into DeFi, which seemed really big at the time. But now, after yield farming got really big, there's now over $45 billion of TVL. And I would argue it caused the bull market to happen. Uh, and the thing is, yield farming is a hack over centralized finance because not in centralized finance, you can't issue shares instantly and continuously to stakeholders. In yield farming, you can do this just by writing some code. And in countries like the Philippines, where over 70% of adults are unbanked, we can skip the entire stocks phase of the financial system and go straight to more profitable and predictable strategies like yield farming on stable coins or on stocks you believe in. So now I want to show a demo uh, on the next slide. Uh, let me share my screen really quick. So I, I recorded a uh, video of using Ubiswap. And you can see here, you just go to this URL and you can have the app on your phone without having to download it. Um, so it's based off the Uniswap interface that you can see over here. So here I'm gonna click connect wallet and connect to Valora. And it will deep link into the Valora app and Valora, after click allow, clicking allow, will connect your wallet. And now you can trade really easily. So yeah, here I selected the Celo token and I'm gonna swap between Celo dollars and Celo. So yeah, if you click swap here, you just click confirm swap, just like Uniswap. Yeah, it's a fork of Uniswap. And you'll open up your app in Valora and it will send a transaction to the Celo blockchain. So another cool thing about this is that this is all just a Web3 provider. It uses the same exact uh, programming as Ethereum. And I'll open source this soon, but basically it'll be really easy to port any app from Ethereum to Celo uh, just by including this Web3 provider. But yeah, anyway, so yeah, the transaction will, yeah, the token transfer happened on the block explorer over here. And like, uh, you can also provide liquidity just like Uniswap. And it's, it's the same exact interface. It's, it's literally just a fork of the, uh, the front end. Um, uh, yeah, so that's it. That's the demo. Uh, could I get the next slide, please? So the timeline. So late February, we'll see a testnet launch. Uh, I want to clean up the interactions a little bit, uh, but you guys will be able to play around with uh, Ubiswap on the Alpha Horus testnet soon. And in early March, we're going to have a launch in mainnet. So part of why we can launch so fast is that we're based on Uniswap. There are no changes to contract logic. All we did was delete some Ethereum-specific code, like basically all of the wrap token stuff. And I, you could, I could see that being very easy for future DeFi projects that want to be, want to be ported into Celo. In late March, we'll see a ledger integration. So a lot of existing Celo holders will be able to use the product with peace of mind. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but yeah, so, th so that's Ubiswap. Uh, please follow us on Twitter if you want to see updates and join the Discord. Also, if you're a builder building on Celo, we'd love to talk with you and see if we can integrate the exchange with whatever you're building. 
And if you're if you're in the DeFi space but not on Celo yet, uh, we'd love to talk with you and uh, see if you might be interested in building a version of your app on Celo. But so that that's Uberswap. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and thank you very much for the demonstration and taking us into the experience of uh, Uberswap. Definitely, this is a great integration with Valora Wallet, uh, providing liquidity and increasing Celo adoption. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. So we encourage the community to ask questions or may, or leave your comments on the chat if you have any any inquiry for Ian. And also we encourage you to join the community on Discord. Uh, let's see, if we have any question. Yeah, please uh, share your question for Ian. Uh, uh, Ian could like answer since we have some couple of time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Let me see some questions. Um, will there be regular MetaMask support? Uh, there are some MetaMask similar wallets uh, that will that will be uh, available on Celo very very soon. Um, so yes, we'll have desktop wallet support and ledger support. Uh, are you considering governance sphere distro? Yes, we are. Um, uh, uh, join the Discord for more updates. Yeah, any concern of Uniswap going on to going multi-chain? Curious of the long-term strategy. Maybe hoping to gain early markets and mover advantage on seller chain. It's a day. Yeah. Time. Um. Yeah, yeah. Uniswap could launch on Celo, but um, if there's already a lot of liquidity on this this exchange, then um, it it would be like Sushi Swap and uh, uh, Uniswap. You would just have multiple exchanges on one chain. Uh, no, app staging is on uh, on mainnet actually, and I would not advise using that because we are going to update the router address pretty soon. Uh, but you can play with it with like a very small amount of money. Okay. Great. Let's see, if we have another question, or we should move in the agenda, David. Uh, let's let's uh, move it in the agenda. Thank you so much, Ian, for being here. Uh, happy to see you soon, and thank you for all the content that you show us uh, today. Yeah, thanks Thank for having me. me. So, okay, in the next section, for those who like trading, we have Hummingbot. It's a community-driven open source project that aims to democratize algorithmic trading by making sophisticated high-frequency trading strategies freely available to anyone in the world. They believe this will lead to a more open, fair, and inclusive uh, global financial system. Uh, Michael Feng, co-founder and CEO at Hummingbot. Welcome to Kineco. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, great, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, and really glad to be here. Um, yeah, so, so Hummingbot, uh, yeah, we're an open source uh, project. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you today about how we partner with Celo um, and how we support the stability of the uh, CUSD stablecoin. Uh, next slide. So this is a chart for how uh, Celo Dollar has traded in the market uh, for the last few months. Uh, so you can see it's it's been pretty stable, you know, hovering around one dollar. Um, and so um, I'm sure you guys are all in Celo community, so you probably know uh, how how this works. But just to kind of recap, um, let me kind of let me tell you a bit more about how how this actually how the Celo Dollar actually kind of gets stable like this. Next slide. So, um, so to recap, there's a mechanism called um, Mento on the on the Celo blockchain, where uh, it's basically like a Uniswap style automatic market maker that rebalances between uh, the Celo uh, coin and the CUSD coin, and so it's it's an automatic market maker, which means that uh, you know um, there's a programmatic uh, kind of like ability for people to swap between Celo and CUSD. Uh, but of course, like like Uniswap and other AMM style ex exchanges. Uh, it relies on arbitrage drawers. These exchanges rely on arbitrage drawers to kind of stabilize the price between that exchange and centralized venues where those assets also trade. So um, Celo and COSD are listed on exchanges like Coinbase, OKX, Binance, and Bittrex. And it's really arbitrage drawers that are kind of like in the market, basically making the price stable by uh, arbitraging between uh, the prices in the decentralized Celo exchange and other exchanges. So um, who are these arbitrage drawers? Well, there's just people in the market running the, the bots. And Hummingbot, um, we provide a, a framework that allows people to build these type of bots. Uh, next slide. 
So, so today we work with uh, many different protocols um, because a lot of AMM protocols uh, like Celo, uh, all, all like uh, they really need arbitrage rules. Um, and and similarly, uh, there's lots of people out there uh, who are running humming bots who want to kind of like earn passive income by running, uh, taking the capital, placing it on different exchanges, and um, providing you know um, basically running arbitrage and earning income from making these markets more efficient. Uh, so so today, ever since Celo launched. Uh, we've so ever since CUSD has launched, we have um, been made this bot available, and members of our community as well as the cell community have been running these bots. So uh, let me show you how it works. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so so this is what it looks like. Um, it's a command line tool. Uh, it's basically just a tool that you run, that you download and you run on your computer or run in the cloud. Uh, so here's kind of like a few examples of arbitrage. Uh, opportunities picked up by the bots. Uh, this is, you know, a, a long time ago when sell prices were still you know, in the one dollar range, um, and um, and so this is what happens anytime kind of you know prices kind of uh, go um, out of whack due to market volatility and so forth between Cello and other exchanges where Cello and CUSD are traded. And so we have many people out there uh, from our community and Cello doing this. Uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, so how can you help? Uh, well, th th this is really a community-based effort. So Hummingbot is a truly decentralized community-based project. We have many people all over the world running bots. So um, if you want to, you can use your own capital, use your seller tokens to run a bot uh, and earn some passive income by providing liquidity and stability to seller. Um, also, uh, we're very heavy, heavily developer-focused community. So we have many developers in the community. Currently, the template we have is a pretty simple template for an arbitrage strategy. Um, and there's many ways to optimize and improve it. Uh, and so we're always looking for developers to come in uh, and you know, join our community to help extend it. Uh, and of course, another way you can contribute is building connectors to other exchanges where Celo and COC trades. Uh, we have most of the major ones, but we don't have CoinList or OK and Coin yet. Um, and anyone can kind of come and uh, take the templates we are currently have and, and create new ones. Um, so that, that's it. That's a, basically a, an overview of uh, kind of how we partner with Celo. Uh, we, we, we have a, a long-term partnership with them. So I think over time, we want to continue to improve uh, this, this bot and how we support Celo. Uh, and, and the next slide, if you could, the last one, you can hear some resources if you wanted to like, you know, um, check out the check out the, the Celo ARB strategy or join our Discord. Here are ways you can do so. Uh, thanks, and I can take some questions. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation and sharing sharing with us with uh, with us your solution. So let's see, if we have any question for you in the chat? Maybe give me a hand. Yes, so please. Uh, if you have a question or a hummingbird, like if uh, the the web page is uh, hummingbird.io. Uh, if you want to see more information, of course, but let's see if there are some questions. Please share the question for Michael. Uh, yeah, I see one question says, what fundamentals do people need to know to use the app? Um, so so Hummingbot is a, um, it's a tool. So it's a you can it's a software it's kind of almost like a node client. So it is kind of aimed at more people who are a little more technical. Uh, but overall, there's many people in our community who are not coders, uh, but they you know they can kind of like use a command line application. Uh, they can. So usually, what we tell people is um, if you kind of like you know if you're if you're willing to do the research, uh, even if you're not a coder, you can use something bots. Uh, but it is aimed at some people who are a bit more kind of technically savvy. Amazing. Um, Yes. Um, Michael, we have another question from Jess. Statical arbitrage will be interesting on your on humming bot. We'll try to implement a mid reversion strategy. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, you can definitely do the humming bot. So um, we've kind of focused on market banking and arbitrage uh, because we th these are kind of the strategies that are valuable for you know, protocols like Celo. Uh, but humming bot it really is a toolbox. And so um, we're starting to see more people kind of like build any type of strategy with Hummingbot. So yeah, you could actually come in and build like a trend following strategy or a mean reversion strategy. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Amazing. So uh, there's a just a, the, the slides will be available. I think there's going to be this event. Uh, you can see in tomorrow, and you can see all the event again. So thank you, Michael, uh, for being here.
and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. We're going to move to our next uh, section with Dimitri De Jong. Thank you so much for being here. And he is going. He is co-founder and uh, at Keiko, and he's going to share with us the proposal for developing compound to sell. Dimitri, welcome to Kuneko, and we are excited to hear uh, about the proposal. How are you, man? Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Can you hear me all right? Perfect. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Hey, hey, everyone. My name is Dimitri Dion. I'm co-founder of Kiko. Um, for me, solo means, um, yeah, the start of Kiko, basically, because in 2019, um, when we were thinking about starting Kiko, I met Marek in Berlin. And he came to us and asked, like, hey, would you guys help us out with building Celo? Uh, we asked, yeah, what's the mission of Celo? It's all about impact and prosperity, which is totally aligned with our values. Uh, we incorporated a lot of those values within Kiko as well. Uh, so big shout out to Mara, Rene, and Sepp uh, for giving us that opportunity because we started one and a half year ago with three people. Uh, currently, Kiko has 25 people, so we, we've been doing uh, very well. And it, our journey started with Celo. Um, what have we done with Celo? Well, we are working on a continuous basis. Um, we've been working on stats.celo, explorer.celo. We've been working on a UBI project with credit card implementation, actually a debit card. Uh, we've worked on the Grameen Foundation project. We work on the Valora app. Um, so we're all over the place, and we and we love it. Uh, we love we love being part of that team. Uh, and today I will talk about the stuff that we have not built yet, but we really want to build. So if you go to the next slide. So uh, more recently, um, Compound uh, announced that they will do a Compound chain. Uh, Compound is a lending and borrowing platform with um, a, a massive uh, user base and total volume locked. Uh, it allows users to um, basically borrow their assets, get interest from that, and then lend against their collateral that they have borrowed. So for me, for example, I want to keep my exposure to Celo. I'm long on Celo, obviously. Um, but I also want to leverage some of the yield farming strategies that have been proposed today. So I want to lock up my Celo, earn additional capital on it, and then uh, use USD, TBTC, uh, whatever is available in, uh, for example, becoming a liquidity provider to Ubiswap, right? Um, the fact that Combound Finance um, is a vetted platform led us to think about, like, how can we collaborate? How can we synergize these communities and, and stand on the, the shoulders of giants? So talking to, for example, uh, Robert Leshner of, of Compound, um, they found that it totally makes sense to think about how can we port the Compound Finance smart contract suit onto Celo platform, on the network, as well as how can we create a bridge from Celo to Compound Chain, which will be released in the future. So for this, we created a governance proposal, uh, basically asking for a grant like, hey, we can build both things. We can become a validator within Compound Chain, essentially creating a bridge between the Celo assets and the Compound Chain network, as well as the other way around, where we would take uh, the Compound uh, Finance suit and deploy that on the Celo network. And this means that we can actually create, let's call it a minor league for lending and borrowing assets. And borrowing that term from Marek, uh, but if we go to the next slide. I can show you a little bit of the architecture of what we want to build. So the first thing we see here is uh, a bit of a technical graph, but I'll guide you uh, through this. It's not too hard. In the middle, we see the Celo network. On the left-hand side, we see the compound chain validators. So these compound chains validators, they will look at specific smart contracts deployed on multiple networks. They call them star ports. These star ports will allow you to lock up your assets like in a bridge, and then these validators will basically look at all the events em emitted from those bridges and consolidate the state on compound chain. So this means we can lock our assets in the star port and then leverage them on compound chain, using them for borrowing uh, against the full compound network. Um, obviously, this would also integrate with the Valor app, which gives them the compound chain access to mobile networks and mobile uh, clients. In the next slide, we'll see the counterpart of that proposal, where we deploy the compound finance suit on top of the Celo network. And this is 
fairly easy, but the devil is always in the details, right? Um, so we will port most of the smart contracts. Obviously, the governance part will remain in compound chain. So we, for that, we will have a delegated multi-c. Multi the very interesting part of this is that now we can start supplying cello assets into this borrowing market. And this means we can also think about um, creating micro financing, micro lending, social lending, impact lending, carbon lending, all of that. And I think this will really empower local communities because they have more ways to convert their assets, leverage their assets, and actually become part of those money markets created by the DeFi uh, suit. So in the next slide, This is the current status of a proposal. Um, I'll, I can drop the link uh, of the proposal that we have. It's a bit more ex in, in depth of what we actually want to do and what the resources are that we want to make available. Uh, we, we estimate we can do this, uh, we can deliver everything in four to five months, including mo mobile application, deploying all the smart contracts, thinking about the governance, uh, creating a block explorer, Oracle price feeds, all of that. There's a lot of moving parts, and we need to make sure that we cover everything. Um, and for this, we are basically asking for a grant. And the grant will be partly funded by the Stella Foundation and partly funded by Compound DAO. So we really want to push this forward. I think it's a nice synergy between those two communities. Um, it does rely on us uh, getting enough traction on this proposal to um, to go to the compound DAO and basically get enough voting power to get that proposal up as a proposal because currently it's only an idea and then start going into an execution contract. So we're super excited to see this moving forward. Uh, we're asking for some support here and if you want to know more about Kiko, I would advise you to wait a little bit longer because my colleague Clement will talk about what we're doing with uh, Kiko Dojo, which is basically where we host our cello validator and we have rewards and we think about uh, social impact around that. Um, and that's it. Dimitri, thank you very much for sharing it with us. Uh, Kiko, compounding governance, compounding finance, for sure allowing lending and borrowing access, promoting inclusion and financial opportunities. So we wish you all the best for the roadmap you have at Kiko. And let's see if we have any questions for the audience. Yes, please, if there is any question from uh, the community or Dimitri, please leave those in the comments. That way Dimitri could answer them. Yeah, getting comp to vote is definitely one way forward. So I see uh, how can we help with votes on compound? Should we buy comp to vote? Yes, or we borrow comp uh, to vote, right? Um, uh, yeah, but that's definitely one of the things. I think one of the things that is also really important is really to start activating this discussion. Um, there is a thread in the proposal where we lay out everything. Uh, we do want to know more about what's the current status of compound chain because it's still in the making for us. It's kind of like uh, we have to figure out what are the development details that we need to uh, take into account. Uh, so everybody with um, knowledge about the subject, caring about the subject, wants to help in the discussion or anyone with um, um, maybe some insights in the Compound community that can pitch us forward or put us in contact with some of the developers of Compound Chain that would be a massive uh, assistance in the back. Dimitri, we have another question from Robert. Uh, how far away are you from 1% voting rights? Uh, so we haven't, uh, we, ha we are, the next step for us is basically to start gathering those votes. So currently we're at 0% and this is kind of the, the first official moment where we say, well, we're going to uh, start um, s setting up the proposal and, and, and start acquiring those votes. Okay. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Clement also shared the link from the proposal. So if you want to go and check it out, uh, you, you can do it. So, yeah, if there is a, no more questions, uh, we can continue. Please let, let's see if there is another question from the audience. S signing off then. Bye. Thank you, Dimitri. Bye bye. Thank you for being with us. Bye bye. Okay. So, What's next uh, in the agenda, David? Tell yes, me. Yeah. <laughs>
I'm really excited for the next uh, section because I, I, I love the projects that are going to talk on community. Like, do you, do you know that studies have shown that a 1% increase in remittances flows could lead, could lead to a 60% reduction on, in extreme poverty? Having tools and a stable asset that we can set easily and low cost have a great impact to society. Uh, in our next panel, our speakers are developing initiatives to pay and serve value on seller. And Sochi Casador partnered at Ecosystem Growth at C-Labs will moderate the discussion about the future of payment on seller. Welcome, Sochi. The stage thank, is yours. Thank you, David. So in the past 13 years, cryptocurrency has gone from an obscure piece of code to an internationally recognized form of payment. We're seeing a transformation in the payment landscape. The pace of change is unprecedented and the adoption of smartphones around the world is driving this digital economy forward. Avichal Garg from Electric Capital said when speaking about Celo, mobile is how crypto goes mainstream. So I'm very excited to welcome to the stage a group of entrepreneurs who have built mobile first payment solutions on Celo. Please join me on the stage. Moses Adenji from Payshant, Sean Yu from MugglePay, Sam Karaoke from Katani Pay, and Leah Capitan from Don Doni Pay. Hi, Sushi. Hi, everyone. Hey, hey. <laughs> All right, so why don't we get started? I'd like to inter uh, invite each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Please tell us where you're from and what you're building on Celo. So, hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Moses Adeniji, and I am from Nigeria. I'm also the co-founder of Paychant. Uh, well, Paychant is a cryptocurrency payment gateway solution uh, that uses Celo Dollar as a payment currency. Uh, what we do basically is that we enable businesses in Africa to accept cryptocurrency payments, and also we enable um, um, recipients uh, to receive payments from overseas uh, using digital currency, which is Celo Dollar. Hi, everyone. My name is... Oh. Sorry, sorry, is it my turn? Oh, I'm sorry. Leah, take it away. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah. I'm currently in Florida, USA, um, but I spent my childhood living in the agricultural island of Mindanao in the Philippines. So I understand the hardships of people who are unbanked and who now, for the most part, have mobile phones and where Facebook is synonymous with the internet. So Doni, Doni Pay is a GoFundMe clone built on top of Celo, where people can authenticate uh, with a Valora wallet to create campaigns for good causes. And to date, we have successfully funded um, a donation campaign such as a disaster recovery in the Philippines. And we are currently in the process of submitting the app to uh, the Play Store and the App Store this week. So hopefully we will see some of you become future users. Cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Sean, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Mago Pay. We make crypto payment easy. So right now I'm in, Shen uh, I'm in China in a city named Shenzhen, which is next to Hong Kong. So we are connected with Celo by joining the Celo camp last year. So currently we are helping the online business to accept the crypto payments like Celo dollars. And uh, last week we just made the Celo dollars as our default payments. And we are so happy to see that um, uh, payments every day by paid by Celo dollars since the day we launched. Sam, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us where you're from and tell us about Katani. Yeah, sure. My name is Samuel Karaoke. I am from Kenya. I'm the community manager at Katani. We are a startup that has built a middleware technology service that enables users to access seller dollars and to offer them to local fiat by using simple codes commonly referred in Africa as UCC. This, is, this allows users to be able to do transactions in real time and to exchange value from the blockchain. Awesome, thanks. So I'd love to kick it off by asking you, why did you decide to focus on mobile? Well, um, I think um, uh, if we should look at the statistics of the smart smartphone usability in Africa, uh, we, we are going to see that it has increased a lot over time. And for example, uh, like, even my mom spent most of her time on a mobile phone. Uh, as she finds it more, more interesting, than watching television. 
So I would say people now do mostly all their day to day activities on their mobile phone. Uh, so this, uh, this has made us uh, to be very sensitive in terms of developing our product and offering to be mobile uh, friendly. And I believe that uh, really, uh, really, with the, with, the, with, the, with the using your smartphone, uh, it will contribute a lot to the uh, you know to the to the crypto space and, and payment uh, payment, especially with the Valora mobile application, uh, which makes crypto based transaction a lot easier for mobile users. Awesome, uh, Leah. Would you like to add to that? Yes, uh, for us, uh, there was really just mobile and probably mobile for a while. We know that many of the recipients for donations are either don't even have a laptop or almost exclusively just use their mobile phones to access the internet and, and also connect to the rest of the world. Great. Um, yeah, uh, for us, is uh, we think uh, because we are solving the payment problems and we think the most credential part will be lower, lowering the barriers of the cryptos. And uh, in terms of the mobiles, it's the, one of the easiest way to finish the whole payment transactions. So it only requires the mobile phones that the customers or users already have. So think of uh, when we are helping these merchants, uh, when they want to get paid, they can just simply use a QR code or they just print a QR code for their offline retail store. So uh, this is all that they need to get paid. They don't need to set up a car terminals or the point of sale machines. So I think for the mobiles, it will be a huge win comparing with others. Uh, Sean, just to build on that for a second, um, we're seeing kind of a rise in this mobile self-checkout. Self you know, can you talk a little bit about real-time clearing and settlement for high-volume, low-value transactions and how that's influenced what you built on MugglePay? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, and I want to uh, share the story when we started MugglePay in 2019. So there are basically two problems standing in front of us because we are helping these merchants to accept cryptocurrency. The two problems is, one thing is not too much merchants, they are willing to accept cryptos. While the second problem is not too much customers, they are willing to pay using cryptocurrency. So that's the two problems we are having. And the problem is so true. And during that time, we only see 0.3% of the payments, they are paid by cryptocurrency. So it means that every, um, every $100 of the payments, we are only seeing 30 cents, they are paid by the cryptocurrency, by, by cryptos. And later we find out that um, it's so cool to purchase a coffee uh, with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, but uh, that's just something good to have, but not the killing app. So um, during that time, we think for the best use case of this cryptocurrency and to use the feature of the uh, frictionless finance will be for the cross-border merchants. Because for these merchants, they are suffering the average cost of 7%. And to be worse, their settlement times is usually uh, on average 14 days in order to, uh, for them to get their money. So um, that's uh, the merch. Uh, so that's how we started MarvelPay to grow our business uh, to helping these uh, cross-border merchants. So some merchants um, uh, previously who use Stripe, uh, which is also another online payment gateway, and now they are uh, use MarvelPay and accept stable coins for their settlements. The reason um, they are uh, migrating from previously use Stripe and now using MarvelPay, and uh, because we are making um, the cryptocurrency as the, to help this frictionless for the cross-border payments. And currently we make the seller dollars as the default payments. So these merchants, they can get paid 14 days earlier and with uh, lowering their cost to 1%, which will be a huge gain for this small business. And during these two years, we are seeing the crypto percentage starting from 0.3% in 2019 and it increased to 5.8% in 2020. And um, in this year, 2021, even though it's only two months, we are seeing the crypto percentage jumps to 11%. So it means $100, um, there is already $11 uh, coming from paying from cryptocurrency. So I'm strongly believe the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. 
And I think for the cross-border payments, these merchants, they are the first people who will adopt this uh, crypto uh, payments. Yeah, yeah four, 14 days to instantaneous. That's like pretty amazing. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the fact that, you know, we're still living in the times of COVID-19. We definitely see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but wanted to talk about how the pandemic has changed, how people choose like what options they have in terms of how to pay. And so Moses, I'd love for you to kind of talk about what you're hearing from the users of Patient. Thanks, Um I would say the COVID pandemic has really changed um, the way we interact with paper money recently. And um, I would say most payments now in Nigeria goes through digital. And um, uh, for, for, for example, uh, there's, there's someone on the patient platform who owns a restaurant and, and sell in a big university in Nigeria. And uh, he contacted us recently around, I think around January, that um, he would love to start taking cryptocurrency payments you know, in, his, in his shop uh, within the campus of the, of the university because um, he's trying to avoid uh, you know, the, the, the cash payment system you know, uh, you know, from, the, from, from, from his buyers. So I would say people have been looking for alternative ways to start taking your know, uh, payment now due to the pandemic. And uh, I think um, cryptocurrency, because of, it, of its, cost, uh, its lower cost benefits and, uh, and, and fastness, this is, going to be, this is going to make it more popular you know, uh, as a payment, payment method post-COVID. Awesome. And your mom is using her mobile phone to check out? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Awesome. So, um, We've also seen this like evolution um, in digital payments and how it's impacting how people give and send humanitarian aid or just help each other out. Leah, I'd love to hear about how um, that's influenced uh, Doni Pay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the United Nations, I think, started accepting donations of cryptocurrencies since last year and even disperses those donations in cryptocurrency. And we think that this is just the beginning. Um, Cello and Joni are the manifestation of that policy and also this institutional acceptance. And I think that it's, um, it's pretty easy to see why because uh, the benefits of near zero transaction fees and also the, uh, the advantage that we're trying to build on Doni is to also create a great user experience um, on top of speed, the transparency um, for campaign creators and donors as well. Awesome. So uh, just building on that a little bit, um, as the audience I'm sure is well aware, Cello's mission is to build an open financial system that creates conditions of prosperity for all. Innovation and payments must consider things like accessibility, affordability, and inclusion. And I couldn't think of anybody better to speak about this than Sam. I'd love to hear how Katani Pay has been embracing this. Samuel? You on mute? Looks like we lost Samuel. So why don't we um, skip ahead a little bit and then circle back. Um, so we had a little fun with Twitter recently. We asked um, the Twitterverse uh, to basically let us know um, when they would begin to use crypto as their default form of payment. 24% of the respondents said they were already there. 28% felt that they would get there in one to two years, 21% in three to four years, and 26 in five plus years. What do you think needs to happen to get us there faster? Well, um, I think uh, there needs to be a lot of, you know, places to spend cryptocurrency payments. Um, maybe like in the restaurants, um, uh, in cinemas, and in grocery stores, and even at the airports, uh, because um, um, this this will this will all foster the you know the the, the, the spending the, the usability of cryptocurrency, and also there should be a way for people you know to 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 pay for their utilities and various subscription services using cryptocurrency. I believe with this, uh, then the fiat money will be less important for people. Sean, anything you'd like to add? And Leah? You can go ahead, Sean. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think um, to make uh, this, um, I also think uh, the most important part will be lower the barriers of the cryptos. And I think uh, Salo did already a great job to manage to help them 
uh, new people to get into the crypto world by helping them to set up the private keys and make it mobile first. And I think uh, for the payments, it will be a two-sided network. So besides um, the uh, actual work by sell of bringing people to the cryptos, I think it's also very important for us to help more merchants to accept the cryptocurrencies, just like um, similar to the Visa accepted here, there will be Valora accepted here or the cryptocurrency accepted here. So that's something uh, uh, I, I think will help to bring this to the masses. Uh, specifically for Doni, um, I think that donors want to be able to give to causes that would give them tax benefits. Um, for example, if you have a big donor in the United States who has the choice of giving to a local hospital, you know, a pretty big amount of money versus um, spreading that across several uh, causes all over the world, uh, he or she would have a bigger preference for doing it locally so that you can get a bigger tax benefit. So for us, I think uh, it would be great to have, you know, and it is maturing, so it's great um, to have this mature ecosystem where we can easily link payments or donations mm -hmm. to a tax deduction, especially in big donor countries like the United States, Canada, and France, or Japan. That's awesome. So unfortunately, it looks like we lost Samuel. I hope he's able to come and talk about all of the great work that he um, has been building with Katani Pay. Um, I um, will we'll keep going and hopefully he'll be able to join us and we'll circle back. Um, but wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about community and customer loyalty. And I think what we saw today and this morning was this excitement around just the, the community that, that we're building. Um, I think as that translates into payments, we're seeing loyalty programs merge with um, reward programs. And I'd love for each of you to share how you think about community and investing in loyalty um, from, um, from your, your, your users. I think um, we take, uh, we take uh, rewards program very seriously at PayChance. And as part of our strategies and plan, uh, uh, very soon we'll be starting our refer and end program uh, in Nigeria and Ghana. And I believe that this will help uh, get a lot of merchants on board you know, to be accepting cryptocurrency payments you know, uh, in, in their various local area and, and jurisdiction. Um, for us, we are focusing on building a recommendation engine for donors to highlight causes that fit their past history of giving. Eventually, we could uh, reward badges for repeated or uh, sizable donations. And we can also do the same for campaign creators um, when they reach certain milestones uh, in the number or size of the campaigns that they have launched and set up subscription models such that campaign creators um, can follow up with uh, the people who have given to the cause um, to, to show them kind of an impact of their donations through either pictures or videos. Uh, yeah, uh, for MagoPay, we also take um, loyalty program very seriously because uh, I, I think that's the way we distinguish with other um, uh, payments gateways and to attract these merchants. So for us, we have uh, different, we have defi defined different layers of the uh, magic school so that the merchants, um, the more um, uh, the more transaction volume they get or the more likely they invite more merchants to get into our platforms, they will get incentives uh, based on uh, the transaction volume and the referrals. So that's something we provide for the community. That's awesome. And it looks like Samuel, you're back. Um, can you hear us? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I think we well, before we had a little bit of audio problem, um, we were talking about um, just innovation and payments specifically around um, how we need to consider things like accessibility, affordability, and inclusion. And I'd love for you to talk about Katani. I know you guys have been doing a lot of work in this space. Um, and yeah, it would be amazing to hear more. Excellent. Um, Kotani is on a mission to connect anyone with a phone to internet, connect anyone with a phone to blockchain networks, where these people will be able to leverage and exchange and transact value and access, and access crypto at the same time. At the moment, we are working on a pilot with uh, Masiko. 
where we are enabling gig workers to offer them from data annotation jobs to local field, where these particular users are just dialing a code and they're given a menu. And it, through this menu, they are able to transact and change crypto to local field. The funds are then moved from the blockchain wallet to their mobile wallet. All this is being done in real time, and of course, it's effective. And is not only limited to smartphone devices, it's actually using, it's actually even targeting feature phones. So it means it's very inclusive and it's very cheap to be used. Thank you. The feature phone um, aspect, I think, is especially important as we're looking on uh, looking at opening this up to the to the broader community. Um, I was wondering if you could share kind of like some of the insights or perhaps early insights, like thinking about mobile money penetration um, and kind of like what you're what you're seeing in terms of people using crypto. Um, yeah, I would love just to kind of hear like early observations on that. That's a very exciting question. Um, cryptocurrency is not that really profound in Africa. This is primarily the reason behind it is because um, 770 million uh, mobile subscribers are in Africa. 57% of these numbers use feature phones. So feature phones are not internet enabled. They have very low to it. And for cryptocurrencies to be mainstream in Africa, we need to be considering and thinking about this emerging market. That's why at Kotanipi, we are using uh, USSD technology to connect anyone with a, with a phone to be able to access this value and promote its financial inclusivity. That's great. And people are responding to the fact that it's near zero, as Leah pointed out, near, near, near zero fees. Great. Yes. Um, the most exciting thing about our solution is uh, the transactional value, which is a 2%. And a few weeks ago, it was very exciting to see one of the users who was trying to transact value from, uh, they're working with, uh, with Toka, and they've been be able to send funds to their Valora wallet. And this particular user was saying that he has been able to, to save uh, enough that he's, uh, he has bought basic amenities for himself. And it was actually very hilarious that he was saying that he was actually uh, looking forward to uh, Valentine's. And I think mm -hmm. it's up to us now to do the follow-ups with these users to really understand and to have a feeling of how the Valentine's was uh, on his side. That's beautiful. And I know we're going to hear from Toka in a bit as well. So um, as we wrap up the panel, I wanted to uh, just ask a little bit about look into the future. What are some of your predictions um, in terms of, and this is for the panel, in terms of um, the future of, uh, of crypto, um, specifically uh, in the crypto payment space? Well, I believe um, in the next um, one year or so, um, crypto payments will, don't, will not be strange again uh, in the uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in any countries, uh, because um, most businesses will be taking it as payment because that's what we are doing uh, in, in Africa with pay chance. And um, I believe um, even, even churches uh, will be taking uh, donations in cryptocurrency uh, because they know it's easy, it's easy for them to spend it you know, as, as payment and even to pay their, you know, their, their, their workers. Um, for, for us, well, first of all, cryptocurrencies are here to stay, despite all the uh, the um, um, hesitation around it at the beginning. Uh, but much like the hype of cloud or AI, I think that the winners in crypto will be companies who are mainly focused on the user and giving them a great user experience and also cost base that would scale. Um, and successful crypto startups will probably not emphasize crypto on their landing page and talk more about solving problems and just making the world a better place? Um, uh, for me, I think the future of the payments will be um, totally decentralized. And I think the platform like the seller will be, um, it, it will just be eating the pie and it will be take, taking the place and it will be a revolution to PayPal, the company like PayPal. Because I think uh, by, doing it by the decentralized way. It's the users 
um, not the monopolies like the PayPal's who have control of our assets. So that uh, see the uh, I recently see the program of the Celo uh, dollars. It's pretty awesome. They have the CUSD rewards. So that the, all the customers on Celo they can have their rewards based on their assets using the app. And also the money flow is very transparent. And the look is uh, even though it's decentralized, it still have a very minimum cost for making this frictionless finance. So I think. Uh, uh, I, I think the future of the payments will be decentralized, and I think Salo will be um, the one. Yeah. Thanks. Um, for me, I believe the future of payments, especially in Africa, is in, on a very good uh, trajectory. Uh, case in point is, when you look at Africa's population, it's very youthful, and it's actually increasing. And these youthful population are constantly looking to the internet for employment, and for advancements in career. And funny thing, and the most exciting thing, is crypto is actually uh, pushing these people. Crypto is actually creating the right environment for exchange of value, creating the right environment and exchange knowledge and information as they understand crypto deeper within the African space. That's great. So we have a few minutes and I'm gonna turn it over to the audience to ask a few questions. I see some posted here. Um, and one of the questions um, from, from Iran is, are any of the companies operating in more than one country? What's it been like interacting with um, government and banks to get, to get set up? Um, yeah, um, I think. Yeah, uh, uh, let me first share some of our um, uh, what we have done. So indeed, we have uh, we, we do have different merchants from different part of the uh, uh, different part of the world. And then uh, the way we do right now is we are providing um, a technical solution to help this merchant accept cryptocurrency. So in other words, we are not become the custodian of them. Uh, of the assets. And you can think of, we are more like a defined product that we're helping these merchants to accept the cryptocurrency and the customer will just pay directly to the merchants. So that's the way how we help the merchants in different parts of the world to accept cryptocurrency. And we are not taking the money by ourselves. I think Moses, you were gonna add something as well. Yes, um, uh, uh, for us at Patients, um, uh, at the moment we are, we, are, we are operating in Nigeria and um, we are going to be launching in Ghana, I think, uh, next month. Uh, but in terms of the, uh, working with the, with, with the, with the banks, um, I, I, don't think, I don't think that's going to be an issue for us because um, um, it, is, it is very easy uh, for us to set up a bank account in, in Ghana just as Nigeria. And um, we are going to be having different, different, um, um, different team for different locations, so it will be it will be easy for us to as to, uh, to 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 settle our our merchants in Ghana uh, with our team in Ghana, and, and also uh, settling our 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 merchants in Nigeria. Uh, if I could just add for us right now, we still had a very limited release and um, and releasing soon in the App Store and the uh, Google Play Store. So. Uh, we're using the Valora wallet app. Um, certainly there were some issues because I think Cello uh, uh, dollars at some point were not allowed um, if you were accessing the app in the US, but I think that's been resolved now for us. Uh, for Kutanipi, we're not having any particular challenges at the moment because we are set off in Kenya. However, we're thinking of uh, growing to uh, markets in Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia, and Uganda. Uh, in terms of uh, legal challenges that we're facing, we are conforming to the standards that have been set, especially around payments in Kenya. And also, we, as we are moving to other jurisdictions, we are conforming, we are, con we are changing ourselves, and we are con conforming to the jurisdiction and the regulation that we are finding in this particular area. That's great. Um, we have another question, just to kind of expand on um, the, uh, the international aspect. And Leah, I know like with um, Doni Pay, uh, there was a lot of aid relief that was um, that was given even to um, 
uh, to just communities uh, in the Philippines as an example. Can you touch on like that international aspect of it and specifically, I think, um, the, like the cross, the cross border um, piece? Historically, um, you know, we, we get a lot of typhoons in the Philippines um, and also uh, most recently there were volcanic eruptions and, and the Philippines um, have, you know, there's so many Filipinos all over the world. We, uh, we tend to get out of the country and work uh, all over. So there's a lot of cross-border payments. And in the past, it's mostly been through PayPal, through, you know, all these um, conventional platforms. Um, so we do think, um, I don't think at the moment that I, I know of any other uh, platform that has, I mean, there are, um, right now in the Philippines, I think there's um, several platforms just for payments. But for one that is specifically for for funding, um, I'm not sure if there's. Um, I'm not aware of um, other ones. So this is kind of what we're trying to um, to achieve with DoniPay, and of course the value would be in being able to accept crypto payment and also be use that and not have to um, switch over to fiat currency. So I think if you know Sean and and uh, the other guys, uh, you know, please come to the Philippines also, or at least if people are listening to um, to build on the Celo platform as well to accept uh, and receive a crypto, well, Celo dollars also in the Philippines. Yes, um, there's exciting work happening in that space. Um, one of my colleagues was telling a story about how her aunt in the Philippines purchased um, some food for a local school, a local school outing. So. Uh, using CUSD, which is great. Yeah, it's it's definitely more. It's it's people are open to it, but right now it's still considered sort of as an investment. Is not not so much as to facilitate payments. Uh, we do uh, Philippines in the Philippines. We do a lot of um, the mobile money, you know. But obviously, the transaction fees are quite high. So getting to crypto payments uh, would be even better. Yeah, and remittances being like a strong use case as well for the Philippines. Yeah. Um, so I um, one of the questions from um, Lawrence was about just the obstacle to crypto acceptance being, um, I think, the fluctuation in value. This comes into play when we think about currencies like um, BTC as an example. Um, obviously, a lot of you have um, built on Celo and are using CUSD stablecoin. Um, wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, that, uh, you know, um, and then what kind of um, the adoption is that you're seeing in your areas. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I want to share some of our thoughts. So that uh, indeed we started with accepting the Bitcoin and Ethereum. And later we find out actually most of these merchants, they do really want to stick to the stable coins. And then we support USDT at that time. And then um, we see the percentage uh, uh, shift directly from Bitcoin, Ethereum to um, a lot of to the stable currency like the USDT and USDC. And right now we are seeing switch to the US CUSD because um, in terms of the merchants, they really want the stable currency. And uh, think of the, the way is, uh, the way we, we think about this is um, currently the people who hold Bitcoin is still a small amount of people. It's just uh, less than 20 million of users. So comparing with this 1.8 uh, billion unbanked people or the total people in the world. So I think it's just the beginning. And I think in terms of the payments, it will mi slowly migrate to the stable coins uh, as the payments. Yeah, I think we're also like abstracting that complexity away from the users, just like with applications like Valora and a lot of what you've built today, it's it's making it almost, it's operating more efficiently. Um, uh, and we're, we're seeing, uh, I think, some like positive traction, as you pointed out earlier, Sean, on that as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 one more sentence to add to that is uh, comparing with Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, several dollars of Valora payments just finish within seconds. So that's um, the payment experience just as smooth as you are using PayPal or other mobile wallets. So that's another uh, a huge gain here. Great. And I know we have a segment later on um, in the session uh, just to kind of uh, where one of my colleagues is going to share more about Valora. Um, I see one last question um, uh, on how this is impacting local communities as well. Um, and Sam, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impact to local communities that you're seeing 
um, with with Katani and um, um, with CUSD. Um, we are actually doing a pilot uh, with regards to that with the Masik of Fentoka, and we are enabling people who even do not have bank accounts to be able to access value. And besides just accessing value, these people are able to cash out to local things. So um, someone can work on uh, these platforms and they're able to get some money. They're able to buy basic amenity. They're able to move forward. They're able to pick this, themselves up and seeing such stories, seeing such uh, small stories being impacted in the African community and actually seeing value being transacted in return is very exciting. And being together with this journey in Silo is very precious. Cool. Um, I see um, Lawrence has a question about um, how ideas and sharing ideas, how to incorporate um, with the Laura. I think just one thing to point out um, to the audience here at, is that three of our panelists today are alums of Cello Camp, and so you'll hear more about that in a second. But it's a great way to incubate your ideas on on Cello as well. Um, all right, um, so it looks like one other question. Um, um, who, who is using your apps? Mehran is asking, who is your typical user? Um, so I know Moses, you ch touched on like university students, was wondering if you could each give us insight in terms of like who your typical user is. Yes, thank you, Sochi. Um, our, our users are businesses. Uh, basically, patients is going to be um, servicing uh, every businesses uh, in Africa, and also uh, our our users are freelancers who, who do their freelance work to to international clients. You know, patient makes it easy for them to receive cross border payment because um in two thousand and I think two thousand and six uh people uh you know removed in Nigeria from from receiving remittance. So this has made this issue a bit a bit complicated for for freelancers in Nigeria to receive their payment. So uh, we are we are we are we are we are going to be. We are offering our services for freelancers in, in Africa you know, to receive payment you know, using digital currency, which is cello dollar, you know, for their service offered. And also, uh, we, we are servicing uh, the NGO and charity organizations in terms of receiving donations uh, in, in CUSD. Uh, of course, we are helping some online merchants. So, for example, if we you, you want to uh, give tips to Shaochi or to give to this panel, <laughs> That's, there's no, 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 uh, currently it's not supported for this live storm, but we can help the live to help accept several dollars for your tips or to accept these payments. Or buy some uh, merchandise, right? Some, some solo swag. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Great. And Samuel, um, you want to talk a little bit about the users? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, would love to hear more about the users of Katani. Looks like we might have another lag. Can you hear us? All right. For Katani Pay? Yes. The, the, uh, could you describe your typical user for Katani Pay? Our users are vibrant young people who have access to mobile phones. Or just, um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I think we might have a slight delay. Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you fine. Um, so our typical users are young people who have access to mobile phone. And this Hello? Yeah, I think there might be a little bit of a lag. Um, and so we were, uh, you were describing the users, um, so please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, uh, we are working with young people who have access to mobile phones. And these young people are working on gigawatt platforms and Kotani Pay is enabling them to offer them to local fiat. And we are also training them by uh, enabling, uh, by starting a campaign called Uncompain, where we're connecting these particular users to uh, bounty platforms where they can earn also rewards and they can also cash out this account. So we are very excited and uh, our typical users are young people who are of 
practice to mother tongue. These are mainly university students. And Leah? Oh, yes. so, sorry. Um, for us, we're, we're still in a very limited release, um, but I, I foresee that uh, the our users on the campaign um, creator side would be people who may, um, who have really small organizations or even just community organizers um, who will create the campaign pretty easily and quite fast on the app and just share it with their network either through um, messaging, you know, WhatsApp or or, um, or their social networks. Um, and, and yeah, so that's, you know, not necessarily uh, for now, at least the huge organizations being that there's a lot more uh, avenues that are open for them. Um, so, so yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. All right. Um, so I wanted just to thank you. Uh, I know we're at time. It's been wonderful to hear about all of the work that you've been uh, doing to build a mobile first open financial system on Celo. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to David. So thank you all. Thank you, Sushi. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Soshi, for moderating and promoting this panel. Thank you, Moses, Leah, Sean, Samuel. You are doing a great job. It's great to see how the entrepreneur global ecosystem is working on financial solutions and see people from different countries. So once again, you are doing a great job. And thank you for sharing with us uh, your solutions and your projects. We wish you all the best uh, for what is coming. Thank you, Soshi. Thank you. Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited too about this initiative and thank you Sochi uh, and our guests for sharing their initiatives. I'm very excited to see how they, these projects will look like in the, in the near future. And now uh, we will dive deeper into technical elements and updates on the Silo protocol. <clears throat> Welcome C-Labs co-founder and CTO uh, Marek to the stage. How are you? Hello, I'm doing good. Good. Thanks for having me. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, you know, when I'm uh, Marikoski, and, and uh, I too, I can't wait to see you in person in Colombia, uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> uh, so I'm really excited to share uh, what the core developer community, community has been on on the tech, technical front. Um, if I lose you, lose you the details um, over the next few minutes, uh, not to worry, uh, this is, is going to be quick, uh, and we've got some really, really exciting content for you right after me. So, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, since the last Kaneko, there's been just, just a uh, real flurry of activity. Um, but before I get into that, I just wanted to take, take a moment to take a look at our, our platinum stats. So let's take the next slide. Uh, it's been really exciting to watch watch these last uh, uh, months. Uh, uh, this week, we've passed 100,000 addresses on the platform. And there's a massive echo. OK, let me switch microphone. Is that better? Yeah, I think it's better. Uh, could you? Cool. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So platform stats. Um, so in case you haven't noticed, this week we passed the the hundred k, hundred thousand uh, mark for the number of addresses on the platform. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, the transaction volume has also been growing uh, at a ever increasing pace. I think we passed 2 million transactions back in January, and we're on track to pass, I think, 3 million uh, around the uh, end of the month or, or shortly after that. Uh, so to put this into perspective, uh, last the, uh, last time I checked, this was more transactions than both uh, Polkadot and Near combined. So pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, usage of the actual platform. Um, also exciting is the fact that the block time continues to stay put at the five second mark. Um, and perhaps most importantly, 
the network has been up nonstop without any downtime uh, since the validator community launched it last year. So big round of applause to the validator community for doing such an incredible job and to the protocol team for building out such an incredible, stable, and robust consensus protocol. OK, so uh, moving on, what's new since the last Kineco? Uh, on the releases side, I'm super excited that uh, version 1.2.2 of the Celeb Blockchain client has been released. Uh, this was a long, long time in the making. Uh, and now allows validators to run with multi-proxy setups. Uh, it also supports validator hot swapping to make it easier to upgrade. Uh, the team also merged uh, a ton of upstream changes from Ethereum and fixed uh, a few issues and bugs. Uh, so uh, that things now lead to better stability. On the uh, attestation front, uh, which is the system that validators use to verify phone numbers in a decentralized manner, uh, the latest release now adds support for eight-digit codes so that you no longer have to deal with those intimidating base64 encoded text messages that you may have seen uh, while signing up with Valora. Um, so that's going to go out in the next release of Valora. And, um, and then the release also adds support for MessageBird, which provides greater text uh, message delivery in, in certain geos. So if you've had trouble in the past getting, getting verified, um, hopefully that will change soon as more validators adopt MessageBird. On the system smart contract side, let's go to the next slide. There have been two uh, contract upgrades since the last Kineco. Uh, and I'd say that the team has really, really hit its stride um, with a really great release and governance process. So they're now producing fully audited, inspectable governance proposals for these upgrades every six to eight weeks. Um, and so that's going to continue uh, indefinitely. It's going to be a, a big, um, rapid uh, set of upgrades over the course of the next year. In terms of what's been uh, updated so far, um, the downtime slashing contract has been improved. Mento, which is the on-chain uh, decentralized exchange used by the stability mechanism, uh, it's been made more user-friendly. Uh, there's been improvements uh, to the oracles uh, in preparation for Bitcoin price reporting for TBTC. Uh, and the latest release also adds support for smart contract-based wallets uh, that support meta transactions. And so this makes it much easier for wallets to submit transactions on behalf of their users. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, speaking of meta transactions, maybe you've noticed now that Valora no longer asks you to pay for your phone verification. Uh, fees when you're signing up. Um, that is thanks to a service called Comenci, uh, which uh, allows Valora to pay for transactions on behalf of its users, and it's using those upgrades that I just talked about. Um, also, super excited for Contract Kit 1.0, which adds uh, a number of incredible new features, uh, and uh, one of which is CIP8. Uh, which makes it really easy to store and reference off-chain data uh, and to communicate privately with other people that you're transacting with. And so Valora will soon uh, use CIP8 to optionally and privately uh, share your profile photo and name with people that you're transacting with uh, in a way that's fully interoperable uh, across any wallet that supports CIP8. So that's going to be something to look forward to. Forno, uh, which uh, some of you might have used before, uh, is Celo's Infura-like service. It's now gone uh, fully multi-geo. Uh, so this means that when you connect to forno.celo.org, uh, you're actually connecting to the nearest Forno server to you uh, so that we can keep latencies low. Um, and then uh, finally, um, the first phase of the Plumo ceremony is now um, wrapping up with uh, 62 contributions, I think around 50 of eight, uh, which came from folks outside of C-Labs. And so this is a very diverse set of contributors. Uh, each contributor contributed 
roughly between 100 and 300 hours of CPU time, uh, which is a lot, uh, making this perhaps one of the most CPU intensive powers of Tau ceremony ever carried out. So that's also really, really exciting. Okay, so what is next? Um, let's go to the next slide. So the, uh, I think the next really exciting thing is the release of the core contract, uh, release three, uh, which is scheduled for around March 18. Uh, this will be the uh, upgrade that will launch the Celo Euro uh, and uh, will also include a validator initiated proposal that will um, increase the downtime grace period from one minute to 10 minutes. Uh, the donut hard fork will be coming uh, after that, uh, which will hopefully add um, Ethereum, full Ethereum transaction compatibility. Uh, we've heard this from a bunch of developers that uh, people want to be able to use their, uh, their existing Ethereum style uh, signing code. Uh, and so once we do this change, uh, you'll be able to use regular MetaMask uh, or any other Ethereum signer uh, to interact directly with the network. Um, the hard fork is also going to have some really exciting new crypto precompiles um, that will make it much easier to do some really interesting crypto on the platform. Many of these things have been um, kind of proposals and EIPs that have been submitted to Ethereum, uh, but never made it in. Uh, and so we're really excited to be offering them to our developers uh, ahead of, of Ethereum. After that, um, Plumo will, will likely finish its second phase. Uh, Plumo, by the way, uh, for those of you uh, who are new to the phrase, is um, the new like client protocol that's going to be launching soon that uses some ZK Smart, uh, ZK Snark uh, magic, uh, making it incredibly fast to sync with the chain uh, using uh, in a fully uh, trustless P2P manner. Um, once it's deployed, it's going to be roughly 1.7 million times lighter than um, what many other uh, protocols are doing today for their light clients. And then finally, uh, this one's really exciting as well. Uh, James Presswich and his team are actively working uh, really hard on a trust minimized bridge to Ethereum, uh, which will hopefully launch at some point in May or June. Uh, that's going to make it really nice to move your assets uh, back and forth between the chains, uh, especially uh, exciting with all of this mobile DeFi uh, that's launching on the Celo platform, as we've seen already today. Let's go to the next slide. And so if you're a developer, you might be asking, OK, what, what are the things that I should be looking forward to? Um, one of the things that I'm excited about is the ability to uh, use the AWS marketplace to spin up uh, full and light nodes on AWS with one click. Uh, that's just around the corner. You can already do it with the um, testnet nodes. Uh, Contract Kit will uh, also uh, add uh, Celo Euro support, uh, as will the CLI. Uh, and then the team is working really hard to add CUSD support to Rosetta. Uh, there were a few questions earlier uh, that people were asking about wallets. Um, you know, even though Celo is fully mobile first, uh, there are still are use cases uh, for desktop experiences. And so on that front, I'm really excited to share that DSRV is working on a MetaMask-like browser extension. Likewise, Nifty Wallet, which is a multi-chain MetaMask fork, uh, has a PR right now to add Celo support. Uh, and then the team at C Labs is working really, really hard to uh, give you Wallet Connect support in Valora so that you can sign transactions on your phone for things that you're doing on your desktop. And so that's all around the corner. Uh, but for the biggest news uh, for developers, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Yanis, uh, co founder of The Graph, uh, who's now engineering lead at the Edge and Node, uh, who has something really exciting to share. Thank you, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. Great to be here. Um, so first, some, some introductory uh, material um, for those of you who don't know uh, the graph. 
Um, the graph is an indexing protocol for querying blockchain data with GraphQL. Um, and it's been around since early 2018. Uh, we launched a free hosted service for developing uh, custom data APIs, which we called subgraphs uh, in early 2019. And it's been powering many of the, the biggest Ethereum based dApps in production uh, since that launch. Um, so Uniswap, Synthetix, and Aave, many others uh, are using the, the graph in production today and have been for a while. Um, and then in more recent news, um, the decentralized graph network was launched just a couple of months ago in December. And um, yeah, that marks a pretty big milestone uh, in, the, in the history of the graph. And so um, the graph is particularly useful uh, for um, fast, modern, slick, decentralized apps that were simply not possible in the same way before um, the graph existed, um, because you had to, like for every small piece of data, hit blockchain APIs, um, loading, loading data for, for any significantly complex um, app would involve a lot of round trips to, you know, to the blockchain, uh, long loading times, and all of that um, is more or less history now. And um, I think that ties in really well with today's theme of designing for all, because it's now significantly easier for, for everyone to, uh, to write dApps. Um, now, so far, the graph is focused primarily on Ethereum um, as the blockchain and IPFS as well. Um, but I wouldn't be here if uh, there weren't some news to share. And today, just uh, about an hour ago, uh, the Graph Foundation announced that the graph is coming to Celo. Um, and that's, that's really good news, um, which is uh, what's great about Celo in this context is that it's largely compatible with Ethereum's JSON RPC API, which uh, makes supporting it uh, easier than other blockchains that are completely different. Um, and being a mobile first blockchain with short block times, I think pairing Celo with GraphQL APIs that are made for mobile and web applications specifically that uh, need to make sure that they don't overload, overfetch data, and you know, need a bandwidth constraint. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think uh, pairing um, a blockchain like Celo with uh, the GraphQL APIs provided by the Graph uh, for fast access to on-chain data um, sounds like a perfect match. Um, work on this has already started uh, with an investigation of the extent to, to which uh, Celo is compatible with the Ethereum API, um, there are some, I think, subtle differences, um, but a lot seems to be compatible. And so that work will then, um, that investigation will then funnel into um, the actual integration work that will happen over the next few months. Um, needless to say, at Edge and Node, uh, we're very excited about this announcement by the Graph Foundation. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing um, what the seller community will be building um, on top of the Graph. Uh, for instance, we saw an um, Uberswap uh, in the presentation earlier. And if the team intends to also replicate the fairly rich Uniswap exchange stats and like dashboard experience, um, you'll be happy to hear that you'll soon be able to create the, the Uniswap, Uberswap data using the graph. Um, yes, that's, that's it for me. Um, thanks, thanks for having me on. Um, and make sure to check out the announcement on thegraph.com. I'll also link it in the chat uh, after I hop, on, uh, hop off the stage. Um, yeah, make sure to check it out. Cool, and um, thanks. And with that, I'll hand it back to Marek. That is super exciting and um, frequently comes up as the number one ask from uh, DAP developers uh, considering the seller platform. So uh, incredible news uh, for all those DAP developers today. Um, awesome. So I just have one last slide uh, talking about uh, what else is coming uh, later today. Uh, maybe we can go back just one more slide. Perfect. Um, there's a few things that we're really excited to, to get to uh, in 2021, uh, one of which is around Celo Commerce. Um, there is uh, a lot of work starting now uh, to bring uh, commerce features to the platform. Uh, that will make it much, much easier for um, PSPs or uh, payment service providers to, to integrate with the, with the platform. Uh, things like time-based uh, authorized, uh, time-based authorizations, uh, holds, refunds, uh, recurring payments, all of the things that, that uh, exist in, in the regular financial infrastructure that um, uh, we have to replicate in order to to make uh, payments even more universally accessible 
uh, on the Settle platform. So uh, keep an ear out for uh, updates on that front. Um, on the business uh, business tooling side, um, there's a lot of work being done right now on batch transactions, uh, and folks like um, Build AI are, are uh, looking at ways to um, build products that let you run your entire business uh, on the Scylla platform. Uh, related to that, also Bitwage is speaking later today, so I would um, stick around for that. Uh, on the uh, scalability front, the blockchain team is also uh, working incredibly hard this year to get us to uh, Visa scale transaction throughput by the end of the year. Uh, they are currently in the re research phase, uh, and there's a lot of promising um, different uh, techniques that they are exploring. Um, so really excited uh, to see all of that work come into fruition by the end of the year. Uh, the crypto team is also looking at the randomness beacon. Uh, you may have experienced this when signing up with Ballora. Right now, it takes around 60 seconds to get paired with uh, randomly selected validators who send you those, those text messages. Uh, that is because uh, of the, um, the current randomness beacon uh, is relatively slow to provide uh, a, a strong guarantee on uh, the randomness that is generating. Uh, but the team is working on something that will be uh, more instantaneous, uh, which would mean that we would effectively shave off those 60 seconds from the Valora onboarding experience or any other uh, seller wallet uh, verifying uh, users using the decentralized fund verification protocol. So, so that's going to be really great. Um, the research phase is over on that, and they're now moving towards implementation. So uh, that's going to be extremely exciting. Uh, certainly, there'll be more stablecoin proposals. Uh, if you have preferences for uh, what stablecoins you want to see on the platform, uh, certainly uh, let the community know. Uh, and uh, there's been also a lot of work to bring uh, and to um, uh, figure out what it would take to bring uh, TBTC into the decentralized reserve that backs Celo dollars and soon the Celo euro. Uh, and uh, and that's going along smoothly as well. And, and looks like um, once TBTC launches, uh, we'll be in a good position to, to to add that to the reserve. So that's everything from me. Uh, but uh, speaking of TBTC, uh, I'd love to hand it over to Doug from Thesis uh, just to give a little update on their ongoing efforts to bring TBTC to sell. So thank you. Hello. Me? Hello, we can hear you. Perfect. Go ahead. Hey. Very welcome. Great. Uh, so hi, guys. I'm Doug. I'm from the Keep team. Uh, we're working on bringing and bridging Bitcoin onto Celo, just like we've done for Ethereum. And if you hit on the next slide, I can just briefly go over um, the steps here. So. We've been working hard to update our code and our dApps to work with the EVM on Celo. And the first step is to bring all of our stakers over to the Celo network, as well as some leftover to incentivize the Celo staking community to um, also stake with us and secure the network. Uh, next is to use that stake and some of the, the reserve uh, to bond and get BTC over onto Celo. Um, I think Merrick mentioned that it would be used in the reserve or any, any other sort of DeFi application. But we're really excited about growing. We have a, a, a community that's growing like a weed on Discord and around the Ethereum um, BTC on DeFi. Um, and we'd love to bring that over to Celo. And we're really excited to work with you guys to get that on Celo because we know your community is really active. Uh, got a lot of stakers, a lot of people interested in getting DeFi uh, with BTC on Celo. I can send a link to the Discord as well um, after this. So that's it for me, just a, a, a short update.
thank you thank you so much doug for for your last update uh, do we have any questions felipe thank you marek and doug uh, we have a question from brian let me see here uh, how much is the minimum uh, no, no what's 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 the silos upper tps limit we got this one from brian what's the silos upper tps limit transactions per second yeah it's a really great question and it's a difficult one to answer i think it, it uh we have to keep um iterating on on that research that i talked about and um uh, and see where it lands. Um, we're pretty confident we can get to a thousand transactions per second, uh, which again brings us to Visa scale transaction throughput. Uh, beyond that, I think it's going to be interesting. Um, I think we'll, we'll have to again keep keep doing research to see where uh, if we can go beyond that. Perfect. Thank you, Marek. Uh, we have another question from Peter and uh, regarding to five second block time. Will this get faster or slower as the network grows? It's a great question. Um, I think there's certainly the possibility of making it shorter. Um, the consensus protocol that we run today um, can achieve consensus in, in uh, around a second. And so we could easily uh, half the block time um, and uh, both increase um, kind of throughput and uh, reduce latency relatively easily. I think the uh, I think we can we can make that change, and it's an easy change through on-chain governance. The question is just is is this the most important thing for us to do right now? And and I think if if people have really good use cases for for shortening the block time, then we'd love to hear from you. Perfect. Thank you, Marek, and thank you guys for the technical update and letting us know the new releases and what is coming up next. We wish you all the best and thank you for sharing with us this time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Marek and Doug. Thank you. David, back to you. Okay, so we're continue, and now the next guest is James Donor. He is a new solutions lead at C-Labs and previously as a co-founder at the Open Money Initiative, he researched the Venezuelan social and economic collapse and the role of crypto has, is, and will play in Venezuela. His work uh, with C-Labs to provide loans to Venezuelan migrants built on those conclusions. Hey, welcome James, happy to have you here. Thank you so much, David. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking from a slightly cloudy Bogota today. Um, as, as, as David um, has, has just said, uh, my, my, my past work at the Open Money Initiative was very much focused on, on capturing the, the incomprehensible statistics behind the Venezuelan social and, and economic collapse and, and trying to put them in a more human context. Uh, frequently, that, that consisted of people telling me about the worst days of their lives and this, this, this huge, terrible fall. Um, that, that is what really inspired me to take this next step um, with, with C-Labs. And about a year ago in the very early days of the, the, the pandemic, um, I, I began a pilot focused on Rappi bike messengers um, to provide them with loans to upgrade from a bicycle to what's called a ciclomotor, or a, a motorbike. Um, doing so doubled their, their income overnight. Um, and it's really my, my pleasure today to be able to, to introduce you all to, to some of the characters behind this. Um, to date, the loans have reached more than 200 people uh, and have contributed to over $250,000 in increased earnings among the people who you're about to see in this, this video. Um, David, can you cue can you me up? I think it's about to sound. Quizás hay un momento en tu vida que tú digas que no vas a poder, no. Si tienes una carga muy pesada, no pienses que es pesada, dásela a Dios, que Dios se encarga de todas nuestras cargas para poder seguir adelante. En el momento de mi salida, la situación estaba tan difícil que cada 15 días la inflación incrementaba mil por ciento sobre mil por ciento sobre mil por ciento. Si me están entendiendo, ¿no? 
entre lo que gasté el pasaje y la comida, llegué para acá con 50 mil pesos. No conocía a nadie. Mientras que en Venezuela tenía un niño pequeño que me esperaba y que tenía que mandarle lo poquito que me hace aquí. Uf, ha sido un, un cambio brusco, radical, sería la palabra. O sea, desde niño, eh, mi mamá siempre me dice, papi, sonríe la vida. Eh, por muy difícil que esté todo, eh, por muy complicado que se hagan las cosas, siempre hay solución. Eh, vi la necesidad para crear un bolso. Un millón de pesos en total de la recogida de las 10 personas que van a dar los 100 mil pesos. ¿Sí me explico? Es un dinero prestado, pero que en el momento te va a ayudar a ti. Conocí un amigo. Fran me dice un día, Rafa, mira. Hay una aplicación que se llama Rappi. He crecido mucho, eh, estoy haciendo lo que me gusta. ¿Qué es lo que me gusta? Estar en la calle, dialogar, coordinar, ser como quien dice un, una persona con un trabajo propio que no le cumplo horarios a nadie, por lo que siempre me he catalogado de ser dueño de mi propio trabajo y de mi tiempo y poder ayudar a las personas que, no, que nos rodean. Sé que vienen cosas muchísimo más grandes y mejores. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I want to highlight something that, that Jorge just, just said there, actually. Um, my, my philosophy, um, as, as much in this and in Open Money Initiative, as, as in my previous work in, in financial inclusion, I, I've always had this guiding philosophy that we should look to the, the best institutions in informal finance when we're thinking about new systems. And the, the Bolsa or the, the, the savings group that Jorge uh, organized was actually a foundational part to reaching the first, uh, the first few clients. Um, I'd, I'd like to very quickly just share a few of, of Jorge's, Jorge's words. Um, He said to me this morning that every day he thinks more with pride about how we are in an indestructible community. Many would be back in Venezuela defeated without the support of these credits. I'm sure the benefits that we've seen to now are just insignificant when compared to future potential. Aside from those who've lived and see what we're seeing, it's unbelievable that a company actually did this without asking for anything in returns. It's only those who see it, only those who live it, who can really, really understand it. Um, with, with that, um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I'd, I'd like to, 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 to tee up the next, the next video, um, thinking about what if, what if we imagined, uh, credit anew, um, where credit is not something that's extractive for an individual, something that just lets an individual build their, their own, um, their, their own lives anew, but rather something that strengthens the community where the dividends really are paid back to the community. Um, With that, back to you, David. I don't think we have uh, audio on the video. The climb back to the top of our mountain begins on the shoulders of the tribe taking us there, filled with hope to revive our home, our culture, our values. Uh, in, in, in closing, uh, these, these users here you're seeing are, are, are real uh, Valora users um, that are actively using the, the, the product. Um, recently, there was, there was this yield program, which or not, not yield, um, but like this bonus program, which was, was rolled out. 
Um, and it's actually been key to, to, to helping Venezuelans move from saving in dollars stored under their mattress uh, to actually saving on, on Valora. Um, and again, to quote Jorge, uh, the protagonist of, of the video and, and my right hand down here in Bogota, um, he says that not only does Valora help the migrant population save, but in comparison with the world's banks, which just make the rich richer, this is designed to give good returns to small savers. Um, and just uh, thanks, thanks from Jorge and from, uh, from everyone in Colombia. James, uh, thank you very much. So I want to say thank you because I am Colombian and I understand the situation of the Venezuelan immigrants in Colombia. So you are doing a great job. Thank you for that. Uh, and wish you all the best. Uh, let me see if we have questions here in the chat. Uh, yeah, Philip Todd says you are doing great job, cool, cool stuff. Uh, he can make you an introduction with iFoot, which is their platform in Colombia. So talk to him and make it bigger what you are doing. Philip Todd on the chat, talk, talk to him later, okay? Amazing. And th these videos that you've seen, uh, just to, to close out, are, are all public. Uh, give, them, give them a look on the uh, Valora app YouTube channel. Um, and stay tuned because there are a lot of uh, additional updates coming coming from Colombia. I uh, just want to add that uh, I I have the pleasure to know a little bit of these guys and it's helped the sense of brotherhood and what this is amazing of a community uh, and what they are doing is super wonderful and is thanks to James. They are super grateful to him and it's, it's really wonderful what you're doing there. So thank you so much. Okay, so we are moving on, and our next guest, uh, we are going to be uh, dive a little bit deeper on into how Salos Tenet of Design for All is being incorporated into Salos project around the world. Let's start with Valora, Salos Native Wallet. Uh, welcome, Denise, partner at Product C Labs, who is going to share more uh, with us a little bit about this. Welcome, Denise. Hello, David. Hi, how are you doing? It's it's great, great to see you and. Loved uh, hearing about all these beautiful stories from Colombia. Um, very inspiring video. So Designing for All is one of uh, the seller communities for tenants. Um, it reads, we believe that to create a truly inclusive financial system, we must begin by serving those who need it most. Personally, it's one of my favorite, or if not my favorite tenant, and it's the one that is closest to my heart and my work. Um, I believe it drives Salo's mission of financial inclusion to reality. It connects us to those who Salo is hoping to serve. In my share today about Valora, I will highlight how the team makes all sorts of decisions like product and design choices following this tent. Next slide, please. Many people may think that designing for all is about reach. I think that's that's a great way to interpret it. Uh, creating solutions for people that serve, uh, solutions that serve people everywhere. Following that interpretation, Valora has already started to reach all corners of the world. We've seen install in 149 countries. But you now know that reach is not how our community tenant is defined. So let's look into Valora adoption to dive deeper. Next slide, please. In the figures on the left, we see adoption in terms of the value trusted by our users and thus trusted to the seller network. Both seller dollars and seller balances have grown over 100% month of, over month. These are balances in Valora. On the right, you see adoption in terms of users. There are now over 33,000 users on Valora, growing 300% month over month. This is really incredible. 59% of these users have a balance in Valora and are active every week. Two countries stand out on the map on the right. So let's uh, take a look at Brazil, a neighbor of Colombia. Next slide, please. In Brazil, there are currently about 13,000 active users. More than half of them have a balance on Valora. This adoption has been driven by multiple universal basic income or UBI projects run by Impact Market, a seller community member. By the way, Marco from Impact Market will also be sharing during Conecco today. In the community of Lara de Freitas, in the state of Bahia, Impact Market is running four UBI projects. As you can see in these flyers on the screen, local merchants um, began accepting Valora payments organically to serve and service the 4,000 UBI recipients in their community. 
And so they are also experiencing themselves the positive impact of this UBI in their community. I think together, Impact Market and Valora are having a really positive force for the community throughout this really tough last year. So with a global user base on the one hand and a very local one on the other, how can we make sure we design and build for all? Let's go to the next slide. So to accomplish design for all, the Valora team focuses on two types of features. The ones that give Valora greater global reach, and on the other hand, the features that make Valora a better experience for those who need it the most. Some of Valora's reach for features are built um, with other members of the seller community, like cash in, cash out integrations in Valora, as well as the option to spend uh, seller dollars in Valora to buy gift cards. These are available in multiple countries. In contrast, local features include like they're much smaller maybe but include options like valora language options for example when valora launched last year um, it was available in spanish and english but once we st started seeing the user adoption in brazil growing so quickly we put our design for all hat on and worked on making valora available in portuguese for those users in brazil who needed a localized experience let's go to the next slide to talk about the cell rewards program so this is a global program on the Seller Network. It has been mentioned many times, and I think it's going to continue being mentioned a lot. But I want to share its impact at the local level in Brazil. As you see from the quote, in this impact market community, the program has been really well received by merchants. What this means is that 48 Valora merchants who are actively accepting Valora payments there in Rafael's community in Lara de Freitas, they now choose to keep their sell dollar balance from their sales in Valora in order to participate and earn sell rewards instead of cashing them out to Brazilian reais every week, which is what was happening before. We see this as a huge signal of trust in our seller community. I find it really amazing. Next slide, please. To end, uh, I want to talk about how we continue to see this community effects from Valora and Impact Market together. In the UBI community in Lauro de Freitas, Rafael, the community manager, and the Valora merchants are organizing a two-day open-air feira or market. They have brought on 200 merchants to accept seller dollars through Valora during the two-day event. The open-air market will expand Valora's reach beyond the 4,000 impact market participants to potentially reach the entire community of Lauro de Freitas. I asked Rafael how we can support the merchants and encourage community members to use Valora to pay and sell the dollars as well. It turns out that merchants have been offering a discount to those paying with Valora, so those receiving uh, UBI distributions. So we offered these merchants to help them by refunding them for the discounts they will provide during, those two day, during this two-day event. Instead of just going for it, the merchants came back asking that we instead support more UBI programs. And so after the two-day event, the Cell Foundation will be donating the equivalent amount of the merchant's discounts to Impact Market in order to fund another UBI project in this community. I think it's a beautiful story of like the impact of the Cell community when we work together. With that, thank you so much for listening. And I pass it on to Anna, who's going to share about TOCA. Hi, uh, great to be here. Uh, really awesome to feel the energy of the whole Cello community in this virtual room. Um, if we could have slides as well. Great, um, I can just continue without the slides for now. Um, so I'm Anna, uh, founder and CEO of Toka. Before this, uh, was an engineer at C Labs for a few years, focused on making sure that Valora is accessible to all, so really performant on low-end Android devices. Uh, so Toka makes machine learning accessible to any team through an integrated data annotation and model training platform. So our annotators complete work from their phones, um, low-end Android devices, similar to many Valora users. And this is instead of using a computer, which is kind of the traditional way that these sort of um, images or content for machine learning is labeled, and they receive streaming payments uh, rather than payment every two weeks. The way that we think about designing for all is rather than taking the model of work uh, that's often used in the US of you work on a computer, you get paid every two weeks, 
um, we've kind of designed with our users, hey, um, you as a university student in Nairobi, Kenya, what's the best way for you to work? And for them, it's kind of working from their phone and it's getting paid in real time so that the same way that, or uh, the same day that they uh, complete work and get paid, they can buy food for their family. Uh, for us, Celo is the ideal block time or blockchain. We need fast block times. Um, we need low fees for small transactions and we need a stable value currency. Uh, the other thing that's really valuable about Celo for us is that it's mobile first and there's a good way for people to directly receive uh, payments. Next slide. Uh, so to look at some of the numbers, we have about um, 100 annotators who are live in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, they're working from their phones. They've completed 150,000 annotations. 96% um, of TOCA annotators preferred CUSD to existing alternatives. Um, so if you look at what it costs to send $5 from the US to Kenya without using CUSD, it's going to cost about $2. And so it's really just not worth sending that kind of micro payment for this micro work and that ends up excluding a lot of potential workers. Um, the other thing that people really value about the COC payment is the speed. Um, so between when they complete work and when they have um, their CUSD that they convert to M-Pesa and then uh, can spend in the local economy, it takes about 15 seconds. So there are two uh, CUSD transactions that happen there um, versus one or two weeks, uh, which can be the sort of delay that happens with something like PayPal. Uh, the average transaction fee is less than a cent for payment. Um, and then we also just closed a pre-seed round of funding of 1.2 million from Flory and other mission aligned investors. Uh, next slide. And here there's a, a quote from an annotator that we recently onboarded um, so this is Phil, a Mercy Corps pilot participant. Uh, for me, this TOCA so far has done wonders, have paid my rent, paid my son's fees for the second term, bought a new blanket, and, and last Sunday even treated my son for a fun day out. Um, so this is just a, a small picture of some of the impact um, that we're having through the kind of TOCA, C-Labs, um, app and pilot that's going on right now. Great, and then next I'll be introducing uh, Marco from Impact Market. Uh, excited to hear more about your work. Hey everyone, oh, can you hear me? Hopefully, yes. Yes, we can, go ahead. All right, okay. Hello, so I'm Marco, I'm speaking from Portugal. Uh, we'll speak more about the impact markets and how we are bringing uh, a conditional basic income to the most challenging places um, in the world. So, okay, next. All right, so basically, and attending to this um, kind of title for this session, um, Designing for All, um, so in this case, we the way we are setting up this UBI is based on several communities. Each community has its UBI parameters, and then um, local charities or, or organizations can just add beneficiaries, and they will be able to access an allowance per day um, from a, from the contract. So basically, the only thing that we have is one button, and that's it. Uh, there is no need for signing up or uh, leaving any personal information or whatever, which is um, amazing, um, especially for the for this, uh, for these people that don't have any kind of uh, or most of them don't have access to bank accounts or whatever. So, uh, okay, next. Yeah. So basically, in less than five months, we are now. Uh, so the system. As, uh, is now providing um, access to UBI uh, to more than 10,000 people worldwide. So it goes from Brazil, uh, Ghana, uh, Cape Verde, Uganda, etc. Um, and the, our beneficiaries are transacting uh, in a monthly volume of over $350,000 um, directly from the beneficiaries, from their Valora. 
it, it it's about 24% of all uh, CUST transfers uh, currently. So all our beneficiaries are creating this uh, traffic. Um, two thirds of them are women and about 10% have more than 50 years old. And we know that uh, we are reaching around 50,000, uh, 15,000 uh, children indirectly. Okay, next. Um, so some interesting findings that we uh, learned so far. So uh, when we thought about, okay, so how difficult it, it will be to use, um, and we try to make it as simple as possible, um, after a few people know how to do that, uh, that's it. They, they teach each other how to do it. And when there is an incentive to get money in the other side of the operation, uh, they they figure out how to do it. Also, um, having a cash out or providing a cash out one or two times initially, even with a, a commission, is actually very important for people to understand that the money that they see in the app is actually money that they easily believe. After that match is done, uh, the the needs for cashing out because uh, because becomes uh, less needed because uh, there is high fees and the process is is heavy. So, uh, and it's better to store money in dollars than in reais. Uh, merchant's adoption is kind of inevitable when we, you have like thousands of people around with buying power that previously didn't have that buying power. And these local merchants operate in places where people have really like uh, very difficulties on getting money to buy the stuff. So suddenly most of those uh, merchants that were about to close also because of COVID, now they are selling five times more um and that's why they are so in love with with valora and so there is no fees against credit cards and they can have dollars also people get interested about how this works because one of the things that we don't kind of say is like we don't talk about blockchain or tokens or, or crypto it's just an app you have dollars there and that's it and you don't need to provide that personal information uh, also local governments are looking into it we see in venezuela people using it as an hyperinflation protection and also this earning sell on balance, it also changes a lot of the dynamics because there is less need for cash out. And also more pe people on those communities want to have solid dollars so they have these assets to these opportunities. So basically between them, they do cash in and cash out in a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Next. Another thing is not, so our system is based, is an anti-poverty system. So we start with UBI and now we are expanding to more income mechanisms. For example, we are running a pilot in one of the favelas. We have almost two tons of um, plastic collected. And basically it's just, we are deploying, we, we are now deploying like just a system through smart contracts that just pay people for all the plastic they collect and then calculate how much CO2 we save us. So, people within those communities can fund it, or even municipalities, or even backers that want to contribute for climate change. And uh, at the same time, it creates in, uh, extra income for, for, for these people. Uh, next. Um, yeah, we started simple with the button and just kind of a color. And now we are expanding to kind of making more uh, complicated, uh, so with more colors and actually a better experience also for the donors and also ability for the beneficiaries to share their stories in a daily basis so people can actually feel what is going on uh, in the other side. Next. Uh, so just, a, so, uh, just uh, as a summary, uh, so far it was distributed about $350,000 in, in five months. We have more than 50 uh, communities uh, currently. So it goes from favelas in Brazil, refugee camps in Ghana, farmers in Philippines, neighborhoods in Venezuela, Cape Verde, uh, Uganda, students in, in Argentina, and also we have um, also other places. Um, currently, we our system is not just kind of cash transfer. It's a kind of each community has a pool with rules and people cl have, uh, can claim money from those uh, those contracts and they claim as they need and they have to wait a certain time before being able to, to claim again. So what it creates is a more dynamic experience where we can actually measure the need of the people over time because they have to claim it. Um, and usually our these UBI uh, programs on average globally is uh, uh, about 24 months. We have more than 50 uh, local merchants. We are growing about 10% a week. Okay, uh, last slide. 
I hope. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and now we are just uh, looking to expand to more vulnerable communities in challenging places um, like um, Myanmar, uh, Morocco, uh, Mozambique, uh, Afghanistan. So kind of more challenging places where this kind of a solution is needed and where uh, uh, we, we can reach. Um, we also would become I want to become one of the, the biggest private UAI initiatives in the world uh, this year. Uh, so currently we are already one of the biggest partner with foundations, philanthropies, also implemented economics uh, to incentivize donors and to improve governance. Uh, also the ability for donors to just deposit funds and redirect their earnings like, uh, like in Mula. Um, and for example, access to microcredit, collective savings. And basically, we want to become one of the major contributors to extreme poverty eradication worldwide. Um, and and that's it. Um, thank you very much, guys. And now I pass to, to the next uh, presenter. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Will, and I'm a partner at Ponto. Um, so at Ponto, we aim to create a seamless experience for using decentralized currency as underlying financial infrastructure. Uh, so we believe that users should not need to be aware of the technology's role in their finances so they can instead focus on using their funds in any way that serves their needs. Uh, to accomplish this, it's got to be possible to quickly move value from cryptocurrencies to local currencies anywhere in the world. Um, and so on and off ramps are one of the main barriers to widespread crypto adoption as users need to be able to trust that they can use their assets to engage with the local economy. Uh, with Ponto, users can build trust in CUSD as a stable store of value that is easy for them to use in their local market. So we're focused on providing the API and interfaces to instantly move CUSD into local currencies. Uh, we're targeting the Philippines, Kenya, Ghana, Tanzania, Brazil, Colombia, and Venezuela in 2021 and 2022. We will be leveraging integrations with local mobile money and prepaid data uh, to make it very easy to move into currencies that are accessible to our users. Um, we are partnering with local banks and pawn companies to support additional access to fiat. So this might be in-person fiat um, or other options that banks can provide that we can't do with mobile money. Um, we are in the final stages of becoming licensed in the Philippines. Um, we're integrating with Valora to provide cash out uh, to mobile money and fiat in the wallet. Um, and so for many of the people who can benefit the most from Celo, uh, it does not matter whether their money is kept in a blockchain or a bank, only that they can access their value anytime they need it. And so according to the World Bank, more than 1.7 billion people do not yet have bank accounts. And it is difficult for them to safely save money and set themselves up for long-term financial success. Um, they are unable to directly participate in the global economy and are limited even in their own local economies. So for us, part of what it means to design for all is to make sure that everyone can have an effortless experience with money, regardless of whether they have a formal bank account. Uh, and today, most on off ramps exclude those people. So with Ponto, we're building the bridges to connect today's financial infrastructure with decentralized currencies to change how billions of people think about storing and accessing their value through Celo. That's me. Thank you very much. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan at Bitwage. Let's wait just a couple of, a couple of seconds. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. we can hear you, Jonathan. All right, great. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, so uh, what, what is Bitwage? Bitwage is a, a global crypto-powered payroll and invoicing platform. We've been around actually since 2014, uh, and, and we've been running for quite a while. We, I like to think of us as at the center of remote work and cryptocurrency, which is really these, these two major industries that are coming to a head that, that, that COVID has actually been a catalyst for. And what we're going to see in the future is everyone is going to be working in these remote work environments, and there's going to be new solutions needed uh, to pay them around the world. And so that's what Bitwage is doing. Um, maybe we should move to the next slide. 
uh, a bit of uh, a bit of statistics on BitWage. We've done a hundred million dollars in transactions. Uh, we're in a hundred different countries, and we have fifty thousand users. We have hotspots in Brazil, Argentina, Philippines, in India. Uh, and one of the, the interesting things about our service is because we're connected to payroll, um, we're, we're able to actually pay unbanked people through our system. Uh, a company is able to pay uh, unbanked workers, employees, freelancers, vendors, anywhere around the world uh, through our system because of our sync into, into cryptocurrency. You know, obviously, we've been around since 2000. Uh, so Stello is actually brand new to us. We, we just launched our integration with Stello this week. Um, and we have uh, uh, press releases that are, that are going out right now um, in, in various countries. So what, what, what does our system do? We're the most flexible uh, business uh, payment system that exists on the market because you can pay with, any, with various fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies into the system, and then you can receive various fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies out of it. And we have two different ways to work, where a company will sign up, they'll invite all their workers and pay everyone, and then we'll also have ways for, for workers or freelancers, gig workers, anyone who's receiving money can sign up, and we actually give them access to a US bank account, a, a, a European bank account, or a UK bank account. They give that to any employer that they want, they get paid into it, and then they choose how they uh, uh, want, to, want to get paid out. Of course, you know, I came from 2013, 2014, so I, I do have a personal love for Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is not the world reserve currency today. That is USD. And uh, as a result, people want USD globally. This is, this is just what we want, what everyone wants. They want the ability to have access to dollars in their wallet uh, in, in their on their phone at all times. So last year we integrated our first stable coin, and what we saw with that is that it, it quickly jumped to being the third largest payout currency on our platform, and that is inclusive of both fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies. So this is a, a, a big trend that that we're seeing that you know uh, maybe people uh, don't don't understand. Uh, cryptocurrencies that much, but they understand dollars and they understand the value of having dollars in their wallets on their phones. And that's why we're excited about the CUSD integration because now we have a stable coin that's not, you know, bogged down by the gas fees on Ethereum and is totally easy to use with these with these mobile number uh, uh, mobile numbers connected to their to their private keys. So we just launched it this week. Um, we have press releases in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, and all these things. And so, uh, what it what it means is is literally anyone in the world can get paid in CUSD directly to their wallet as long as they're exporting services to the U.S., the EU, to the U.K. So, let's say you are a software developer in Brazil, or you are a digital nomad moving from Africa to, to, to East Asia. Maybe you're Philippine workers or Indian workers, you know, doing a business process outsourcing. Uh, all these people can get paid and do get paid through our system and now have the option to do it in, in CUSD. And what I, I'm really looking forward to is uh, more, working with uh, uh, more partners for the, the cash out options. I think that, that, as the cello industry grows and there's more capabilities to go from cello to local currencies that that this has the opportunity to to really explode um, and be a strong use case on our, on our system um, I don't know if anyone has any any questions that they want to um, want to ask about but uh, yeah that's it I think for now we don't have questions, but let's recap at the end if you want. So I think let's move to David and at the end we see if we have questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Yep. Ah, okay, Ashley, sorry. Welcome. Hello. All right. Ashley, so my name is Ashley Taylor. Um, I'm with the resource network. Um, I'm the chief business development officer and we are building a decentralized protocol for mutual credit. 
Next slide. Um, so we are for uncollateralized business credit backed by products and services. Um, and this means that businesses can basically get a credit line for us. They can get access to other goods and services in the network. And instead of paying back with money, they pay back with their own goods and services. Next slide. Um, so just to kind of explain um, how our credit system works, um, we're working with a type of credit called mutual credit. Um, and we love Zello because they actually have defined mutual credit um, in their documentation as something that they're excited about. Um, so for people who aren't familiar with mutual credit, I'll explain how it works. Um, so we have a use case, we have Niran. He has a farm where he has raw cacao and raw coffee beans. Next slide. Um, so he can basically get a credit line from Resource Network. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that this can happen. Um, in the legacy system, you know, he has to sign a legal contract, he can connect um, a credit score, he can connect his bank account, um, his accounting software, um, but we're also exploring models like the Grameen Bank, where um, he can actually join with a network of businesses that are vouching for him. Um, next slide. So he gets this credit line and then he finds that he someone to build him a website. So if his credit line had been approved for 5,000 US dollars, and these are um, a unit of account, it's not actually US dollars. Um, so he can basically spend uh, $800. Now he has a credit line for 4,200. Next slide. And now Nahid, who made the website, has $800, but she doesn't have to um, spend it with Niran, she can actually use it with a hotel. So this kind of shows that there's a marketplace where we have products, we have services, we have stays and overnights. Next slide. Um, so one thing to really mention here, which is cool about our app, is um, you can go into a negative balance. Um, so when you have your credit line approved, um, you can basically go and spend it, and then now you're in debt to the network. Um, so in this case, uh, if you were in debt um, 800, you know, uh, we call them resource dollars, um, now you need to sell 800 resource dollars to get back to a zero balance. Um, but what's cool about this from a financial inclusion angle, um, so say that you didn't have any of those um, you know, credit scores or things like this, you could essentially build up credit in the system by offering your products and services, going into a positive balance, and then that's actually going to generate a credit score within our system. Um, and with positive balances, you'll also be able to exchange them um, using other DEXs or other markets um, and in for CUSD or other stable coins or assets, whatever you need. Next slide. So we're a new protocol. Um, we were supported by Flory um, last year. Um, in November, we deployed our first ERC-20 mutual credit contract on Celo, which was super exciting. Um, this month, we are getting ready to launch our MVP. Um, we're doing the transaction layer um, between the businesses on Celo. Um, we also have a CIP for uh, Celo for a mutual credit um, token which is uh, something I can send to you if you're interested in that. Um, we have a governance token that we're going to uh, launch along with our um, credit lines to make this a decentralized protocol. And uh, eventually by the end of the year, we hope to have this uh, mostly run by a DAO. Next slide. So this is my email. Um, you can also check out our website. Um, in terms of the things that I wanted to mention here, and I'll be following up about a lot of these products about sort of credit building tools um, within our system and how we can work with you. Um, and then other things that we're very interested in are uh, people who have you know credit rating or credit worthiness um, products or, or skills and that want to integrate with us um, and help us basically validate credit. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley. Also, thank you to Anna, Will, Jonathan, and uh, Denise for sharing us uh, all the statistics and all the progress you are making and achieving on your different initiatives. So we look forward to see you progressing on your roadmap and wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Ashley, and everyone.
Let's see if we have any questions for you guys. Uh, David, can you give me a hand with this, please? Yes, or, Sheed, uh, if we have, we are a little bit back in the time. So maybe people could like ask some question and they can answer in the chat since we are a little bit back uh, late on the schedule, okay? But uh, thank you, Felipe, for, for, for the insights. And yeah, there's a saying uh, that says like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And now we will move into some community announcements of opportunities um, to support community growth learning and success uh, together because Cello is its community. Welcome back, Jarrell. Please start us off. Hey, thanks for having me, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here again. I just like to do a little, uh, do a callback for my, for my make a mobile campaign. And I, I really want to just kind of give a little bit more context to, uh, to all those great projects that you just saw. All of them have just kind of displayed what they and their communities need built or what they're building for their communities with Cello and obviously with a mobile uh, first um, perspective. But these are all teams that have code out there and they have these ideas out there. And our, our hackathon, I would love to see anyone who's interested like just using their tooling, building on top of their ideas and taking it to just the next level and the next level. And maybe they have something that you could use in your community and it just needs to be tweaked a little bit and you wanna see some additional features. I know the impact market UBI is an incredibly interesting thing to me. And then there's the the plastic um, the plastic aspect that they're hoping to add too. And these are all like ideas that need brain power behind them. So uh, I wouldn't sell yourself short if any of you are out there like, hmm, I wonder if I could build. I'm sure you can. I'm sure you've got great ideas that plenty of people would be interested in. Um, David, could you next slide? Yeah, so once again, I just want to get you uh, to whip out your phone and scan this QR code. Um, go to our, our, our splash page for, for the Make a Mobile Hackathon and just see how you can contribute. We'll be posting prizes for like the actual hackathon prizes for um, for everyone to work on starting on February 25th when the hackathon uh, begins then we will uh, have a series of events. Uh, you'll see a lot of these same faces again, uh, like Impact Market. You'll see Merrick for sure. You'll see myself and many others around the around the community that'll be joining and giving kind of like mentor talks, but also like giving just uh, actual uh, presentations. You'll also have access to um, mentors from the C-Labs team, but also mentors from the Cello Camps community. And when you're done, you want to demo what you've built, uh, you, the judges will be a series of people that are closely tied to, uh, closely tied to C-Labs and the Cello community. And that goes from everyone from Polychain to Malzilla and all sorts of uh, judges that you'll see coming through. Um, so really encourage you to get involved, uh, join our Reddit, follow us on Twitter, follow our Gitcoin tribe page for sure, and uh, join the, the hackathon and come help us make it mobile. Uh, back to you, David. Hey, it's uh, Andy, and um, I'm ready to talk to all the uh, developers out there. And I want to talk to you today about Figment Learn. So let's jump to the next slide, please. Um, so um, if you want to learn about uh, developing on blockchains or you want to learn more about Celo, we have a way for you to do it that guides you through an interactive tutorial. So each step of the way, you can verify you're doing the right things. And if you complete all five steps, which ends in you deploying your first smart contract, um, you can actually earn CUSD. So if you are a developer who have built in Web2 before, if you built on other blockchains, if you're just learning how to code, this is a great way for you to uh, get started. And at the end of it, you'll have tokens in your account. Um, so here, I'll, I'm gonna paste a link right in the chat. Um, there you go. Um, it's called the Figment Learn Cello Pathway. Um, we also have a community of developers where um, people are helping each other through this process. So if you're nervous about, um, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get stuck or I don't know if I ha know how to install such and such tool, we have people here ready to help you. Uh, we have there, there's a whole community of people making videos, making walkthroughs. Um, but the main thing to know is that you can get started without having developed before. Um, you'll learn about how to connect to Celo nodes. You'll learn about how to query the network. You'll learn about how to even go through and deploy a real smart contract. Um, and it, the, the goal here is that it can sort of get you started, get you ready um, for, for to do the next thing. So like I said, whether you're coming from a web development background, whether you've developed other chains, it's a great way to get started. And uh, there's a built-in community for you. So if you're a developer who's interested in this, I put the link in the chat, or you can go to learn.figment.io uh, and get started. 
So that's the end. Um, I'm ready to hand it off now to uh, learn a bit about Celo Terminal. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zviad, and I wanted to uh, share Celo uh, Terminal with you all. Um, so Celo Terminal uh, is a desktop wallet app uh, for everything Celo. And you might ask, you know, why desktop app when we've been talking about all this mobile outreach uh, throughout this whole Kineco? Uh, mobile is great for mass adoption, but uh, for higher uh, asset holders, you know, who need more security and for, for more advanced use cases, uh, we do need sort of an exposure to desktop too. And this is where a Silo terminal comes in that prioritizes, you know, more concentration on security, privacy, and more advanced features. So as it is today for users, it already supports things like, you know, it has a ledger support, it has support for local accounts. You can do staking, governance voting, uh, sort of all sorts of stuff that only exists in a command line tool other than in Silo terminal, essentially. So that's from a user's perspective. And if you are a user and you bought a bunch of Silo and you don't want to keep it on, a, on an exchange and you want to self-custody it, I would definitely recommend it to go check it out. Um, but the second part of Silo Terminal that I want to you know, uh, showcase here is for developers. So if you're building a, a D app right now, a decentralized app, uh, it's quite a challenge to build build its UIs. For mobile, there is a pretty good story for Silo right now. But if you want to get exposure to you know, having a ledger support uh, or having more complex app interactions, um, it's quite a bit difficult right now. So this is where Silo Terminal comes in, where it's an extensible platform where anyone can build apps uh, for it. So you can check it out. There is a GitHub. It's fully, fully open source. And it comes with, uh, you know, it's batteries included. It comes with a lot of stuff that is already pre-built. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, wheel for your uh, own D app. So that's a quick summary of everything. And uh, I will move on and hand it over to Clement. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Perfect. Go ahead, Clement. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to say that I'm very excited and, and happy to be here today. Um, I think um, the design for good presentations were also amazing, and I'd be super excited to continue the conversation and uh, start working uh, with some of you guys. Um, and. Yeah, today, um, although you already had kind of an introduction to, to Kiko through Jimmy earlier, I'm very happy to be uh, announcing a new um, validator uh, and particularly uh, delegators reward scheme. Um, we've been ideating for a little while um, internally on how we could uh, basically give back part of the rewards that we uh, received for running a validator on, on Cello, uh, giving that back to the community and trying to find ways to gamify a little bit uh, the voting process and so for that reason we've designed a virtual environment um, that i'm super happy to uh, share with you today uh, in the slack channel that will basically allow uh, people that delegate to our validator to start minting a voting token um, that will be uh, minting on the 30 uh, epoch window and that will allow you to vote on which uh, charitable uh, causes uh, we will be donating to so uh, we want to we want to use that uh, as a playground for governance and also uh, gradually open up the governance of these different uh, proposals uh, to the community. Uh, but right now we are actively looking for uh, partners uh, that we can partner up with to get uh, a flow uh, of uh, charitable causes that uh, users will be able to vote on. So if you start delegating to our validator. Uh, you will be uh, minting uh, this, this, these Vmojo tokens that uh, will allow you to, to vote in a voting app that you will find in this environment. Uh, yes, thanks for sharing the link. We are super nice. Um, and uh, yes, right now, as I said, um, honestly, uh, I think you, everyone here is doing a fantastic job. And um, yeah, I'm very happy and, uh, and proud to be part of, of this community. Um, I will pass on to Rachel from, from Cello Camp now. 
Yes. Thank you, Clement, and welcome to Rachel. Hello, I'm Rachel, Program Manager at CelloCamp, and today I'd like to just briefly introduce CelloCamp and some key dates to note. Um, CelloCamp is an eight-week virtual incubator and mentorship program that helps decentralize technology entrepreneurs and developers build sustainable businesses on Celo. So to go over some key dates, there are two stages in Cello Camp. There is pre-camp and Cello Camp, and we're presently in pre-camp, which is our application phase. And we have some great open events coming up in early March. Um, our application deadline is March 23rd. And to um, apply, you can visit us at cellocamp.com and you can find the application there. Our camp finalists will be announced on March 30th, and the camp itself will run from April 5th through May 27, and the winners of Cell Camp will be announced on June 3rd. So again, to apply, please visit us at cellcamp.com, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at info at upright.gg. Um, we look forward to receiving your applications and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Uh, passing it on to Imran. Thank you, Rachel, and welcome to Ivan. Let's wait for a couple of seconds. David, I think otherwise we can continue with Deepak if he's ready, and then we come back to Ibrahim. Can you see me? Hear me? Hey, hey, hey Deepak. No, 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 no. Oh, go ahead. No worries. You go first. Thank you. And then Deepak. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you, Deepak. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, my name is Imran. I am one of the general partners at Bolt Capital, which is an early stage uh, crypto fund. Uh, there are probably three areas that we focus on generally, uh, but hoping to work with some of you that are building a space today. But the three areas of focus is decentralized finance, infrastructure, and end user services. And, and the way we see this space uh, is that you know a lot of the infrastructure that has been built today will power some of the newer applications that we're seeing. So one of which is like Magic, which is a uh, single sign-on solution for uh, startups that want to build an onboarding solution that would allow anyone to easily access start uh, access protocols and some of the products that are being built behind it. But the way we see this landscape overall is that there's going to be a lot of high, like a lot of the infrastructure and applications that are being built are being built for areas of need. So one of the areas that we're starting to look into is like places like you know Africa and South America, um, and there are incredibly bright teams that are like really solving some of the key issues that they're seeing in their in their environment today. Uh, and so what we what we look for as a fund is kind of areas of opportunities of what the founder is looking to build that that can potentially solve kind of a macro problem within the country and in itself. Along with that, leveraging some of the core infrastructure that's been built within decentralized finance or some of the onboarding solutions like you know, such as magic as an example of this and then the other area that we're looking at is um you know primarily DeFi, and DeFi can encompass everything you know whether it's uh payments remittance it could be you know providing you know financial infrastructure for 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 a country that may not have the best infrastructure in place and and allow more and more folks that are uh you know that aren't participating in, in their current financial world to be able to participate in a very seamless fashion. So what we also launch in, in parallel to Bolt Capital, which is a early stage fund, uh, is the DeFi Alliance. And the DeFi Alliance is a collective of market makers, trading firms, uh, protocols that are coming together to really kind of take us from, you know, let's say a million users in DeFi that are active today to a billion users. And we're doing that in three ways. Uh, the first is, um, uh, bringing on onboarding institutional liquidity from like market makers like Jump Trading. Uh, number two is hiring and recruiting, and then number three is regulations. 
Um, and so those are the kind of the core functions of both the Volt, uh, of Volt Capital. Along with that, the DeFi lines. Um, I'll pass it off to Deepak. Thanks, Imran. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Right. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Hey, everyone. So my name is Deepak, and I'm one of the three stewards uh, for the Cello Community Fund. Uh, and we created a proposal a few months ago, and it was passed last week. So we have access to about uh, $3 million plus worth of Cello that we want to give out as community grant. So what we are creating here is a way for the community to bubble up these uh, projects and fund projects without any expectation of any equity so that we can also fund uh, projects that have like a social cause and may not be the best fit for a VC fund. Of course, if you are looking for VC fund as well, but you want to help, uh, help getting started, you can come to us. So what we are looking for is projects that uh, are people that are building uh, tools for other cello owners or tools for other developers who want to build on cello that align with cello's mission and if you are like me and if you're excited about cello's mission and you want to help spread the word you want to help evangelize uh cello and valora you know we want to support you like if you want to create a meetup or if you want to create some educational resource this is the perfect place to come and get uh, funded basically uh, and again like uh, what is the difference right like what we want to do is you have other funding options like you heard about polychain you you have the cello uh, foundation what we are is we are more community driven and also we want to be able to provide funding for people throughout the year right like let's say the applications have closed for cello foundation so you can always come to the community fund and ask for uh, funding and also we we uh, are just three stewards and our hope is to move a little faster uh, 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 compared to other uh, funding options that you may have so what we are planning to do is we'll be uh, funding small medium and large projects uh, our proposal just went through last week so we are still uh, figuring out our uh, structure with figuring out the application process so it will take us about three to four weeks to create uh, this process so in the meanwhile uh, our website is up it says coming soon but it's already up you can go check the website out and you can also reach out to us via the email i've also included my personal twitter so these are different ways to reach us for now please reach out to us we will put you on a list and uh, let you know when things open so yeah, as always, we want to help Cello reach its mission of building financial prosperity and inclusion for all. And I will, with that said, uh, I will pass it on to Eric from Cello Hub. Hi, uh, thanks, Deepak. And hi, everyone. My name is Eric. Uh, many of you may know me as Human uh, on Discord. Uh, and I'm an undergraduate student at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California. Uh, I'm so impressed by all the amazing work taking place on our platform. It's really beautiful uh, to see our mission render into reality. Um, speaking of which, have you ever wanted to see all the cool projects being built on Celo? Well, today I'm excited to announce the launch of a completely redesigned Celo Hub, your portal to the Celo ecosystem. Uh, Celo Hub is a website gallery showcasing all of the applications, developer tools, and infrastructure projects built on Celo. Uh, we have everything from wallets, DeFi, and impact projects to payment SDKs, data APIs, and more. So whether you're a user, developer, or just a curious human, uh, be sure to check out cellohub.org. Also, uh, if you know of any other projects on Cello, whether they're a work in progress or live, uh, please let us know by clicking the Submit a Project button on the side menu. Uh, we're actively adding new projects every day. Uh, and before I let you go, I want to leave you with a call to action. Uh, when I first joined the Cello community in 2019, I really had no idea how to contribute as an outside member that barely knows how to code. Uh, so I became an active member in the Discord uh, and quickly noticed that many newcomers ask for a list of wallets or projects built on Cello. So that weekend, I cranked out a super simple website that does just that using a visual website builder. Uh, and after sharing it with the community, I was able to re some, receive some funding 
uh, and bring on a fellow classmate, developer, and friend, Daryl. Uh, and in the last 10 days, we managed to do a complete redesign and deployment. And uh, here we are today. Uh, so I guess moral of the story is do what resonates with you. Uh, if you're a designer, make some wireframes for an app and share them with the community. Uh, if you're an educator, make a cool video showing how great Valora is. Uh, and if you have no idea what to do, just engage with the community, and you will eventually find your purpose. Uh, thanks for listening, and now I'll give it back to David. Thank you, Eric. I want to thank all of you guys for your community announcements, Andrews, Vai, Clement, Rachel, Seb, Deepak, Eric, all of you, thank you very much for the announcement. And we encourage, we encourage all the community to join Discord and be part of the different groups of work. And OK, so we are ending Cuneco, the first edition in Colombia. So we, we hope you have a great experience with us. It's been a pleasure to be part of this Cuneco with you as a co-host today. Uh, and I hope these announcements and initiatives have been able to provide a vision about what Silo and what will be possible if we come together to design for all. Thank you very much for joining Cuneco. And David, any last words? Thank you, thank you Felipe, for that, uh, that cute and amazing words. And please just remind community that you can go to Gitcoin and explore what uh, how to participate and develop um, Celo, please join uh, this crew. I know that there's a lot of a lot of uh, questions that probably uh, you can go on and, and, and this crew and ask them. And please don't forget about joining the hackathon that Jarrell mentioned. And and of course, if you have an idea that you want to develop on Celo's blockchain, there is Celocam. So we hope to see you over there. Thank you so much. But of course, we want to end this amazing event with good energy that you can go to wherever place you are, you go with a lot of energy, right? And we want to end this event with a urban Colombian flavor. So you are going to end uh, with um, with one of the most loved Colombian artists. Can you guess which could be? And see you soon. Thank you so much for being in Coleco, hosted in Colombia, beautifully. And please, uh, thank you so much for being here.